Assistant Vice President of Patient Engagement with the Lung Association. And we are so excited to be here today. Personally, I, I am because this has been about two years in the making and we are very thrilled to continue this very important dialogue with all of you today. But more importantly, we appreciate your willingness to take us along with your journey of what it's like to be someone living with chronic cough and to care for someone with chronic cough. But before we kick off today's meeting, I wanna go over a few housekeeping items and the format for today's program. Today is the micro, we are using Microsoft Teams. And for those of you who have not used Teams at this point, I just wanna point out some of the icons and what they mean. Um, if you look at the top of your screen, the far, you're gonna see a little people icon. If you click on that, it will show you today's, you don't need to use that, but it's just a feature if you wanna know who's all invited or participating in the call. Um, icon that you'll see is the chat icon. That's one of three ways that you can ask a question or um, make a comment. All you need to do is click on that chat button and on the far right screen, you'll be able to type in your message and we will answer every question and respond to every comment. Um, the other way that you can also respond is the next icon, which is a little hand with, um, uh, is a little, Am I still there? Am I still? Yeah, okay, I'm still here. Okay, I wasn't sure if it, it clicked off. Um, if you click on that icon, a uh, little yellow hand will raise, and that will also let us know. I will be monitoring as well as Nell, our facilitator. If you want to make a comment, you raise your hand, and we will call on you. You just want to remember, after you raise your hand and your question or comment is heard, you want to click off that hand so we know that you um, are done. The other feature is the... Um, a video feature, which is the amazing um, way that we can see everybody's beautiful face, but sometimes it does give us some connectivity problems. If you are having problems with a delayed screen or a voice, you can click off your um, video. I'm going to ask um, everyone who is not um, part of the stakeholders, if you're a staff member, go ahead and turn off your video because sometimes it makes it a little better. So we want to have um, the stars of our show today are the stakeholders. So thank you. The other icon is the um, microphone. The microphone gives you the ability to be on mute and um, to unmute yourself. So we are asking folks who are in the listen only mode to try to have your um, mute button on so we don't pick up any unnecessary background noise. If you are a participant and you don't want your microphone on the whole time, you can just click it on and off very easily. If you're having problems um, and you have to leave the meeting, you just click the red button and that will have you leave the meeting and you come back in the same way you came in. You go to the calendar invite and click and it'll bring you right into the uh, meeting and we'll wait. We'll be waiting here for you. Today will be recorded, but it is not going to be a public facing recording. So we'll be using it for internal purposes when we pull together our findings report of today's information. So um, those of you who are participating today, you will be of the finding of today's program. You will, after today, um, you'll get an email, another email from me, um, and there'll be a few follow-up items. Number one, it will be a follow-up survey to talk about some of the items that we discussed today. If you have not sent me your W-9 or your photo, please do so after today's meeting. I will also be scheduling a time with each of you to do your follow-up story, your chronic cough story with us. But that's all the housekeeping items that I have. At this time, I want to introduce Dr. Al Rizzo, who serves as the Chief Medical Officer for the American Lung Association, and he is the organization's, organization's senior me, um, medical authority. Dr. Rizzo has long been a key medical advisor to the Lung Association as a member of the Lung Cancer Expert Medical Advisory Panel and a leading media spokesperson for the association. In his role as Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Rizzo plays a key role in multiple areas of our mission, including the um, lung helpline research, including our Airways for Clinical Research Centers, our awards and grants program, as well as our advocacy, communications development, and health promotions. And Dr. Rizzo is responsible for, responsible for ensuring that the Lung Association is always using the best science and medicine to formulate and deliver on our mission. Without any further ado, Dr. Rizzo, I'm going to hand the program over to you. Thank you, Annette. And thank you to all of you for joining us today for the Chronic Case Cough Stakeholder Meeting. And as Annette said, uh, we're pretty excited to hear from each of you. 
and appreciate your willingness to take the time to share your chronic cough journey with the organization. As an organization, the American Lung Association's mission is to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease through our efforts in advocacy, education, and research. Today, we add to our efforts in these areas regarding helping people living with chronic cough. In addition to providing research funding available to seek out potential treatments, we've launched awareness campaigns to elevate knowledge of the condition and have initiated educational programs to support those living with chronic cough. Now, these efforts include launching the Chronic Cough Quiz on lung.org, which is a 10-question quiz to help patients understand if they may have a chronic cough and what next steps to take. We've had more than 21,000 individuals take the quiz, including some of you joining us today. We've also had over 393,000 individuals visit our lung.org chronic cough website to review our chronic cough materials. And these same materials are also incorporated into the comprehensive lung helpline library of resources that our trained helpline counselors utilize to serve callers inquiring about chronic cough. We also recently launched Living with Chronic Cough, which is an online community hosted on the Inspire platform. This enables adults living with chronic cough to connect with others, share experiences, and provide virtual support to each other. All these efforts are a critically important part of helping individuals living with chronic cough, which we know is a widespread health problem. We know that chronic cough can be caused by various conditions, including asthma and rhinitis, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and other lung diseases, including chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. But we also know that as many as 12 and upwards of 46% of chronic cough patients have a cough that has no known cause and is unresponsive to current medical treatment. And this is known as a refractory cough. That's why today's meeting is such an important collaboration between patients and providers. And the outcome from today's program will help inform the American Lung Association on our continuing efforts to help those living with chronic cough. Besides the support of research on chronic cough and the various awareness and educational tools I just mentioned, for the past two years, the American Lung Association has been advocating on behalf of chronic cough patients by seeking specific new ICD-10 diagnostic codes related to cough. And it's exciting to share with you the fact that the CDC has reported that starting next month, six new ICD-10 codes will be activated specific to cough. The existence of these codes and their incorporation to physicians' electronic records will help validate cough in its various forms as a disease that warrants appropriate diagnostic evaluations, and importantly, when the time comes, be codes that will be utilized to help with coverage for specific medications directed at the different types of cough. Now, before turning things over to our facilitator and our panelists, I would like to acknowledge that the American Lung Association is grateful for the support from Merck and Company on activities that included efforts to educate individuals about chronic cough and raising awareness of the disease and helping to characterize it as more than just a cough or a symptom of something else, but rather a very real burden with physical, social, emotional, and economic consequences. We're going to hear much more about that from our panelists. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our facilitator for today's discussion, Nell McCormack Abom. And Nell has been a career telling stories, starting conversations with some of Pennsylvania's most compelling people, from governors to death row inmates. Nell delves deeply into the personalities and motivations of Pennsylvania's newsmakers, always seeking the context of events and issues that shape our communities. She runs her own award-winning communications practice and has consulted for the American Lung Association, Tierney Communications, and the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, among scores of state and national clients. From the world-famous Radio City Rockets to the 2015 Redland U.S. Little League World Series champions to many C-suite executives, Nell provides expert media and public speaking training. She's been honored for her journalism, earning a regional Emmy as host of Smart Talk, on WTIF-TV in Harrisburg. She's a summa cum laude graduate of the Roy H. Park School of Communications at Ithaca College. She's a Philadelphia native and an eternal Philly sports team fan, for which I sympathize with her. And most importantly, the proud mother of three outstanding young adults. Nell, 
Thank you so much, Dr. Rizzo. It's really a privilege and honor to be here with all of you and to especially be able to hear from uh, both the patients. This is really centered on your stories, but also some of some of the nation's leading people who medical professionals who are working on this problem. So I'm really thrilled and excited to be here and eager to hear your stories. Uh, I wanted to give you a brief run through of what we're going to do today. I'm going to have each of you in turn introduce yourself with a short brief take on your medical journey and as well the medical professionals we have with us today and then we're going to break it into specific discussions where the patients you the stakeholders in this as well as the medical professionals can talk amongst yourself about specific things we want to look at the patient educational gaps when it comes to chronic cough, we want to identify patient and caregiver support that's lacking. Where are those gaps or barriers? Then we're going to identify patient expectations of their healthcare providers, because that's one of the most, outside your family and your friends, your healthcare provider is the person with whom you have a very deep relationship. They know what's going on in your body, what your problems are medically, and then you're trying together to find the best solution to help you. We'll take a break at that point, which will be about 2.20 um, so that you can stretch your legs, et cetera. Then we'll convene back again at 2.30 and we'll have a facilitated discussion on access to care barriers. Um, we really wanna understand coverage, diagnosis, and improved outcomes, the kinds of real experiences you've had, and your own recommendations and suggestions as patients. And then any other gaps you have seen or come across, whether it's you personally or others uh, who have this condition who have shared with you something. And then, very excitingly, we have a storytelling session with a master storyteller, Laura Packard, where we want to get you energized and ready to share your stories in a dynamic way that can affect public policy, legislative decisions, and just general public awareness about this perplexing condition. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add is that uh, about three years ago for an uh, eight week period, I lost my voice and it couldn't be explained why it was happening other than something was going on with my vocal cords. I went and saw a specialist. So I've walked a little bit through your journey and for two months, I, who's made my business uh, and my living by talking, couldn't talk. And with young teenagers in the house, et cetera, it was really kind of difficult. I can empathize a bit with what you've gone through, but I know your journeys have been long and uh, is somewhat fruitless, and we want to do everything we can to change that. So uh, at this time, what I'd like to do is start with our patients. And Paulette, I'm going to have you go first. If you could introduce yourself and generally where you're from, and then just a brief two minute snapshot of a little bit of your chronic cough journey. Oh, I get to go first. Yes. <laughs> I wasn't expecting first. Okay. <laughs> I'm Colette Nye. Uh, I live in uh, Middletown, New York. Uh, I um, professionally uh, sign language interpreter for over 30 years, uh, both in the educational and uh, freelance sector. And that was uh, quite a challenge when you have a cough. So uh, my journey though, uh, back in about, uh, at the age of 38, um, I started having asthma and it became chronic asthma. And I developed a lot of allergies. And on top of that, I landed up having reflux. And so I've suffered with a lot of allergies and reflux and my asthma just kept getting progressively worse. And so I was in and out of the hospitals and a lot of different medications from inhalers, nebulizers, and prednisone. Um, at that time, as years just continued with the asthma, Back in about 2005, I developed some polyps on my vocal cords and uh, I had to have surgery. And remarkable, I met this wonderful doctor who took care of that situation and I continue to have regular visits with him because um, there's some damage to my vocal cords where they don't close properly. And this is why I have this very husky voice. And um, so as seeing him uh, through, uh, he started to notice that I have this unusual cough. And I go, oh, yeah, well, I have asthma. And so the, this conversation continued for quite a while. That's it back in 2013. So I saw him in 2005. All those years, I started developing probably this cough. And he started noticing it. And he said to me, you have 
of a chronic cough and you have, uh, he gave me names for neuropathy, uh, a sensory issue going on. Um, I couldn't put it together because all for decades now I'm suffering with asthma and my cough to me is asthma. Um, he asked me to just continue to do some research on it. There are other people that have the same situation as you just to check it out. And I continue to do the research and found out there are people that have the same situation as I do. I've called it my mystery cough after a while. I tried to explain to my pulmonologist that this laryngologist who's been taking care of me tells me that I have something other than asthma that's causing me to cough. And then there became a little bit of a conflict between a pulmonologist and a laryngologist. Not that I was spoken to me directly, but I could sense that there was definitely something that they're not on the same page. And it was very uncomfortable for me as the patient. But as the patient, you're your best advocate. And I continued to do my research. And I went back to the laryngologist also, and I started some of this treatment with some medications, which did not work for me because I had some reactions and I tried two different medications. And one of the other medications, the last one you wanted to try, I felt a little apprehensive about because it was, I'm gonna say the name of it was tramadol. And I just felt very concerned about having to be on something that is considered a narcotic. Mm -hmm. um, so time just went on and then I just gave up. And things just got progressively worse. And I lost my voice again. I mean, totally lost my voice. I had to go to another doctor. And this doctor now was another pulmonologist that my regular pulmonologist recommended. But this pulmonologist was very pro uh, chronic cough and that diagnosed me with chronic cough and then sent me to another laryngologist that would then help me restore my voice. It took months to restore my voice. Uh, get me off a lot of inhaled medications that were making even more things worse for me. Didn't realize that was causing more of an issue for my life. And um, that was about uh, 2016. So from then to the past five years, I've had more support, more understanding, and um, I allowed these doctors to... Uh, treat me and although I still walk it's still part of my life but the journey continues well thank you thanks for sharing that um and we'll get into some of those specific kinds of issues as we go along uh, next is Dr. Ann Seeleg and thanks for joining us and you are joining us from Massachusetts today so welcome Dr. Seeleg thank you thank you put my microphone down um I'm happy to be here and happy to meet all of you. This is wonderful to have this forum. Um, I a little background on me. I'm a pharmacist by uh, profession. Um, have worked uh, quite a few years in both community retail pharmacy, acute care pharmacy in a hospital setting, and most recently for six years as a medical writer um, in um, evidence-based medicine that's used at the point of care for um, clinicians. So <clears throat> I have quite a bit of medical background um, and I you know, was hopeful this would help me in my um, own personal health issues, but um, I admire what Paulette has gone through with this process because my journey has not been that in depth to try to diagnose what's going on with my cough. Um, I get a lot of feedback from my family that says things like, you should really have that checked and why is that happening and um you know constantly it kind of rears its head up at different times and i say i have had it checked you know i i've discussed it with a couple of internists i've discussed it with an allergist um <clears throat> and i've come along a lot of dead ends with this process um i ha i don't have any other really underlying um medical issues. I don't have asthma. I don't have COPD. I don't have necessarily GERD. Um, so there's not a lot to blame it on. And there's, I think from the clinician's perspective, there's not a lot of concern that there's an issue here. But um, it certainly is is bothersome to me. It seems to kind of impact a lot of my 
<clears throat> social settings and my uh, work settings, I give the example of just last weekend, I went for a walk with my daughter and we got this wonderful smoothie from a local place and it was quite cold. And uh, I just coughed the entire time that we had this walk. And I kept saying, I'm so sorry, you know, but, um, you know, it's, it, I, I think it would be great to increase awareness in this. It would be great to uh, fund some, you know, medical research that might say this is important for these people who are experiencing this. And, and that's why I'm awfully glad that, it, you know, you've brought us all together today. Um, like I said, I, I, I really haven't spent a lot of time in personally getting this evaluated because it, it can be a real time zapper to go down the roads that sounds like you did, Paulette, um, to, you know, see a lot of different specialists and kind of deal with the dynamics involved there. So um, I once I hit a couple brick walls, I said, well, I'm, I'm done for now until there's more answers. Well, thank you. I can imagine the frustration of that for sure. Uh, let's see, we also have with us Dr. Ellen Burns Cooper, who's from Florida. And uh, Dr. Cooper Burns Cooper, we'd like to hear from you now about a little bit about your journey. Uh, hello, can you hear me okay? Absolutely, welcome. Well, thank you, Ellen Burns Cooper, and uh, I live part year in Cleveland and I live part year in Cocoa, Florida. And I've been coughing about 29 years uh, up until May. So I am from a family of seven. There are four sisters, and all of us have a chronic cough. All four of us. One may, one of my sisters may actually be on this call today. I'm not sure. We didn't get a chance to connect. Yeah, I think she said she had a work meeting. She's not going to be able to make it. But real quick, you just said 28 years. You don't even look 30. I don't know. Maybe it's my monitor, but Thank that's you. a long time. Yeah, I am 40, I'm 47 years old-ish. I might take off a year or two, but I've been coughing that long and uh, I've been to hospitals in five different states, 12 different doctors. It's been allergies, MS, chronic uh, cough, bronchitis, um, uh, acid reflux. None of those have been proven. I've taken all the medicines and I'm, up until this year, I got off of them. I've coughed every day of my life for about 30 years, at least five to eight times per hour. I teach for a living. So I go out to different companies and I teach executives. You, you can see where I teach at universities. That is very um, annoying to people in the audience. They get used to it. I also get paid to do guest speaking. So that doesn't work very well. And up until this year, I decided to take matters in my own hand. I got off all of my medications, disconnected with every doctor I've known. I don't return their calls. And my background in PhD is in chemistry, so I decided to do a design of experiments for myself. I was sick of coughing every hour of my life, and I found that there were 15 things that if I do them, they're a pain. Some of them are not so bad. Avoid this. Don't go around this. Can't turn the ceiling fan on. Don't eat black pepper. Don't do this. I haven't coughed since about May 15. I might cough a little bit throughout the day but it is probably 98% better. This is the first time I've gone five months without coughing. But if I miss one of those steps, it is a nightmare. So I'm finally sleeping six hours a night and I decided to just take matters in my own hand because I was sick of going from state to state, just being given the same diagnosis, the same medicine that didn't work. So I hope that helps. Uh, it certainly is informative and um, we'll get into a bit more of some of the steps that you, you take perhaps as we go along. We have one more um, patient who's participating. Is Brian with us? I wasn't able to notice before we started if he had joined us. Brian, are you there? He may join late, I guess. Brian Hunt from California. Uh, we were hoping to hear from him too. And um, now I'd like to introduce our medical panel. And again, doctors, I would ask you to give, you know, a brief synopsis of the area uh, that you primarily focus on, and uh, maybe some some words for what you've just heard from these folks. We'll start with Dr. Robert Wise, who's the um, Airways for Clinical Research Center's principal investigator. So welcome, Dr. Wise. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a uh, pulmonary physician. I have a uh, clinical practice as well as doing research, and my research is generally related to airway diseases uh, such as COPD and asthma. Uh, but uh, like all pulmonologists, uh, we 
we, we uh, face this challenge of chronic refractory cough. And um, uh, it's, it, I say it's a real challenge, and I think we've heard from uh, our patient group uh, how frustrating it is for them to see physician after physician after physician who can't help them. And I know there's little sympathy here, but there are a lot of physicians who see patient after patient after patient and are unable to help them. And that leads to a lot of frustration and negativity on the part of healthcare providers. Uh, what I have uh, come to learn, uh, however, is that um, Chronic cough is a is not usually a serious disease, but it's a very very morbid condition, and a lot of people don't realize it. They figure, well, if it's not cancer and it's not emphysema, uh, 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 it's not going to hurt you, and um, uh, so what? But uh, patients' lives are tremendously affected by this, and uh, al although our, our panel has sort of alluded to this, uh, it has a tremendous social impact on people. Um, even before COVID, you, people didn't want to go on an airplane because they'd sit next to someone and, and they're coughing and the person would get up, or they couldn't didn't want to go to a movie theater or church. Uh, because of coughing, disturbing people, uh, or, or people thinking that it's some contagion. Um, um, and so, um, uh, so it has a, a tremendously isolating effect on people. The other thing that a lot of people don't recognize, I think a lot of doctors too, is that a cough is a maximal forceful muscular um, uh, stress and people who have a chronic cough, who cough hundreds of times a day, uh, develop chronic fatigue. They're exhausted because coughing is a chronic, um, heavy exercise. And very often patients feel they have fatigue, but they don't know why. And many doctors think this, this is, well, this must be some sort of depression or uh, uh, or um, patients feel like they're they're being given short shrift because of some of these non-specific um, symptoms. So it's an isolating disease, uh, and that was before COVID. I can't imagine what it's like to sit uh, uh, and visit other people with a cough uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, the other challenge of chronic refractory cough <clears throat> is that, um, and, I, and I work with some very good basic scientists who study the uh, nerves of the airways and the lung and the connections of the lung to the brain, which is where uh, ca uh, chronic cough often um, uh, begins. And the, the problem, as my colleagues tell me, is that this is really a neurologic disease that's being treated by pulmonologists, okay? Uh, and unless somebody has really um, spent a lot of time studying uh, the, the condition and the pathophysiology of it, uh, it, it's very hard to both understand and treat it, in part because of the myth that has been promulgated by uh, some um, uh, very uh, influential um, physicians that all chronic cough is due to either asthma, GERD, or postnasal drip, period. If it's not that, it must be the fault of the patient. So um, uh, it, it's really been the Europeans who have taught us that chronic neuropathic cough or irritable larynx, or there are a hundred different terms for it, uh, is a neurologic condition like a neuropathy that, um, uh, that needs to be treated in that way. Um, uh, the final thing is uh, unrealistic expectations, both on the part of the physician and patients. It's like, uh, uh, many conditions, it's not so much the 
condition itself as the fear of it getting worse and what it portends. And very often um, uh, with enough um, uh, uh, work, we're able to keep chronic cough down to a manageable level, although in in only rare circumstances can it be completely obliterated and cured. OK, so um, so part of it is is setting proper expectations on the part of both patients and uh, physicians. Uh, so it's it's a great challenge for physicians. It's a great burden for patients. And uh, I really think we're just at the very beginning of uh, understanding how to deal with this and the fact that the Lung Association, um, you know, after uh, over 100 years in business is finally uh, taking on one of the cardinal uh, lung conditions uh, really, I think, uh, portends well um, for the future. Well, you had a lot of uh, meat in there that would be uh, interesting. I'm sure the patients on the call will have some questions too to, to go from there. Uh, let's turn to Dr. Lori Slovarp. And uh, doctor, you're with the University of Montana as a professor, and I understand you're a speech pathologist and you work a lot on behavioral therapy, but give us a, a sketch of your background, where you're coming from as you look at chronic cough and patient care. Yeah, uh, first, thanks for inviting me to be here. I'm. Um, actually quite ecstatic to be able to represent my colleagues and um, I would love to, to not necessarily at this very moment, but to know from our patients if they ever saw a speech therapist, you could even raise your hand. Yes, that's good. Um, so as a speech pathologist, I specialize in voice and upper airway disorders, and I've been a therapist for over 20 years and I uh, obtained a PhD in interdisciplinary studies in 2015, and my complete line of research now is on chronic refractory cough. So I have treated patients with the condition that we're talking about today for years, and I will say that um, uh, the patients here today, nothing you told me is unusual. I hear it every single day. I just talked to one of my mother's friends yesterday who referred her to me and it was the same story. And I have immense compassion because generally the story is I've been coughing for years and years and I've seen every specialist that could possibly um, know anything about cough and I've been prescribed a ton of different medications and nothing has worked. And while speech therapy, which I like to call behavioral cough suppression therapy, doesn't work for everyone. The efficacy data is actually very strong. Um, so there's been some pretty great design studies on our treatment that have shown uh, a benefit, a significant benefit in uh, upwards of 70 to 88 percent of patients. And these are all patients that are at their wits end that are had the same story as yourself. And um, this disorder is, in the patients that I treat, a neurologic condition, as Dr. Wise has discussed. And in Europe, it's pretty commonly called cough hypersensitivity syndrome. So I describe it to patients as the nerves that regulate your upper airway are not working like they should. Those nerves actually are known um, through lots of research to be highly modifiable. They change a lot. When you get an upper respiratory infection, the sensitivity of those nerves go up, which is why when you have a cold, you cough. One reason you cough when you go out and it's cold outside or talking makes you cough. But for some reason, um, that hypersensitivity sticks around. And we believe that then the cough is actually perpetuating it. So what we do in therapy is we teach patients how to suppress their cough. And there's more to it than that, but that is the seminal piece of the treatment. And um, over time, if patients are successful, then their, their, their cough, their, their feeling of the urge to cough disseminates a lot. And I have had lots of patients where the cough goes away. So um, I would say that 
I would, while I would not call it a cure, I have had patients where they report their cough is gone or nearly gone. Now, the, the disadvantage of this treatment or the drawback is if you can't suppress because you're so sensitive or for a variety of reasons, the treatment is less effective. And I have actually developed a treatment that I'm testing right now in a clinical trial that allows us to test, to, to use this treatment in a controlled way. Um, and I, I can't reveal too much because it's going on right now and it's a placebo controlled trial, but we're, we're combining what we do with a, um, a natural substance. And the whole point of the treatment is the, the whole target of the treatment is to reduce cough sensitivity. Now, we don't know if it were, and I have had some great results and, and you know, the data is still coming in, um, but we'd, if this works, we'd, we don't know, we won't know for a while, but the research hopefully will eventually reveal it, whether or not it is an actual change in the sensitivity or it's a change that is in the inhibitory pathways that come from the upper portions of our brain that help us kind of ignore certain sensations. So there's been lots of studies that have shown that patients that have this chronic refractory cough are less able to suppress a cough than people that don't have this condition. Because you can give everyone in the world cough stimulants that will make everyone cough to, at, at certain levels, and then you can test how well they're able to suppress. And people with chronic refractory cough are not as successful. And they have been functional MRI studies that have shown differences in these patients in the higher parts of their brain. So it's a complex condition. I'm extremely passionate about it, primarily because my profession and what we can provide. And I, when I say we, I really should say the properly trained speech pathologist that has extensive experience in this can be life-changing for patients. And many of them never get to our door. And those that do have commonly been coughing. Like, it's a success story if I see a patient that's been coughing for two years. That's amazing. Usually it's 10 to 20 to 30 years. And many of those patients are remarkably improved with the therapy. So, so my goal in my research is to understand this condition more improve awareness to patients and to physicians because as a speech therapist i have to rely on providers to refer patients to us and so if they aren't aware of it or don't consider it a credible treatment then patients just get, get shuffled around and we can be considered a last resort which is unfortunate so very honored to be here and and excited about the future in this realm yeah, fascinating research. Uh, has Dr. Sidney Brayman joined us? Is Dr. Brayman here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yes, I can. Thank you. Welcome. Wonderful. Yes, I'm sorry that I couldn't. I tried to get on, online and <clears throat> it didn't work, so I'm on the phone right now. <clears throat> and uh, I too am, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I listened to the patient stories. And um, as, as previously said by the other two uh, uh, doctors, uh, this is, they're so common. Uh, I have been interested in cough for four decades, and I'd like to admit my cough, my, my first manuscript uh, was actually 1977 when uh, Dr. Richard Irwin and I realized that uh, uh, a, a comprehensive review of cough was necessary, that many physicians were not comfortable at that time uh, in knowing the causes of cough, the, uh, uh, the, the potential uh, treatment and approach to cough. And uh, it was really that that started us off in, in this career. One, one of the things that uh, we did, recognizing that, that more education was needed, uh, both physician and public education, patient education, is uh, uh, we began a series of guidelines uh, for the approach to cough, the treatment of cough, uh, through the American College of Chest Physicians. And we started this around 2005. <clears throat> I've been since um, uh, 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 with that group. Um, I, uh, at, the, at the time, I was a professor at Brown University and uh, more recently uh, have been at uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. <clears throat> and my, uh, so my interest in cough has been really long standing. I, I was so impressed uh, with our pharmacist patient 
who uh, uh, told us that she had been through many medications, uh, she probably is aware of the fact that in the U.S., uh, over $7 billion, with a B, billion dollars, uh, are spent every year on cough medications. Uh, these, sadly enough, as we've heard uh, uh, the testament today, uh, don't really work very well. Uh, they are given <clears throat> uh, often uh, uh, for health respiratory infection and colds, uh, but um, also for people who have had a chronic cough and are seeing their physician for chronic cough. There is a Therefore, a tremendous uh, frustration, as you've heard already uh, from patients, that uh, uh, medications they're using are just not very effective. Uh, one of the things that you heard is that there are some at least perceived common uh, causes or what we put, might call associations with cough, uh, such as what has been called the upper airway uh, cough syndrome. Uh, we don't really understand mechanisms of many of these uh, cough uh, conditions. Uh, we do now know, and it was as, as was well mentioned by Dr. Weiss, that uh, we are recognizing that the receptors, the nerve endings that initiate a cough, mainly, as you've heard, in the upper airway and the throat, the, the larynx, the voice box, and some of the bronchial tubes, uh, that, that these uh, uh, are very heightened, these, these nerve endings. They have, uh, they're overly sensitive. Uh, and we understand that perhaps some of these um, uh, diseases that we're familiar with that we know are associated with cough, uh, such as chronic rhinosinusitis and post-nasal drainage, uh, such as asthma, such as acid reflux, uh, may in some way be associated with the inflammation that then incites uh, the hyper-responsiveness of these nerve endings. Uh, as you've heard, uh, uh, many are feeling that, <clears throat> that these chronic cough conditions are really uh, a, a neuro, neuro hypersensitivity that they're actually, as you heard, maybe uh, neuronal diseases and uh, diseases of, of, of nerves. Uh, and I know there's been a tremendous attention uh, toward the use of neuromodulators, and they haven't been too, too successful. That is, that is uh, medications that will affect the nerves themselves. Uh, but more uh, uh, recently, uh, there is some exciting work that's being done uh, looking at uh, affecting these uh, receptors, the, the chemical uh, problems that these receptors have um, that might initiate a, a lower threshold, meaning that you can have cough uh, more, more readily with very simple things. Uh, what, what you heard uh, from some of the patients is that sometimes very simple things uh, can cause cough, uh, uh, such as laughter, uh, uh, such as uh, perhaps just talking long periods of time on the, on the phone. Uh, exposure to crazy things like just perfumes or, or, or deodorants and things like that can, can precipitate a cough. And this all gets to the theory that, that the uh, little nerve ending, these receptors are so sensitive uh, that, that irritants uh, like that, and obviously passive smoking and other things, passive smoke exposure and other things uh, might trigger off uh, the, these receptors. Uh, how about the uh, fact that you might go out in a nice, beautiful, cold morning uh, you look, there's plenty of sunshine, you take that deep breath in, and all of a sudden there's coughing because of the cold air stimulation. So these are some of the things that I think are, are exciting. Unfortunately for patients today, they're more futuristic. Uh, some of these uh, uh, medications that may be uh, altering uh, this overly sensitive uh, nerve. Uh, there are two conditions that now uh, have been uh, um, popularized uh, and these are sort of new terms that I think most physicians don't really um, don't know about some of them and don't understand. And that's conditions called the refractory chronic cough and the undiagnosed or unexplained chronic cough. Uh, we recognize that sometimes we find a, a definite reason why a patient might cough. Uh, he, uh, and, and we treat that condition. Uh, we also recognize that a, a great number of patients don't have just one cause of the cough. And treating one cause won't lead to success. You've got to treat all the causes of cough at the same time. Um, but what we realize is that many of these patients, uh, uh, after vigorous treatment of their perceived causes, still have a cough. It's so-called refractory, meaning that we're just not getting to the bottom line of this condition, uh, the refractory chronic cough. Uh, then there is this uh, uh, other group of, of patients where the doctors have done an extensive investigation, testing, more testing, CAT scans, uh, perhaps uh, studies in your esophagus, and 
nothing comes up positive. And these are the UCC, the unexplained chronic cough. So I think uh, the future uh, is possibly looking brighter. I think in the recent, last few years, we've had a better understanding uh, of some of the mechanisms that we didn't appreciate previously that you heard Dr. Weiss uh, mention. The last thing I will say uh, is uh, I, I am extremely pleased to, to hear the speech pathologist getting involved. Uh, we, I've noted personally, and, and certainly the literature, as she said, uh, does support uh, their uh, interventions and oftentimes highly successful interventions. So this is really maybe a multidisciplinary approach uh, uh, to, the, to the chronic cough patient. And as I said, I think uh, we're going to hear a lot more in, in years to come and a lot more positive news. <clears throat> that's a great way. And that part of this with uh, the outlook that positive stuff is coming, that's great. I'd like to also acknowledge that representatives from our sponsor, Merkin Company, are joining us. Uh, in particular, I believe that Gwen Rathbun. Gwen, would you just like to introduce yourself briefly? And we thank you again for sponsoring today's discussion. Sure. Hi. Thank you so much um, just for the opportunity to join. Um, I'm Gwen Rathbun. I'm Associate Director of Alliance Development at Merck, um, and I'm relatively new to the chronic cough space, um, but just finding it really interesting to hear from so many different perspectives today. Um, so thank you so much again for the opportunity to join um, and to um, provide support to you all. That's great. Thank you so much again. And we also have a number of American Lung Association staff members who are on the call. We thank them for participating and just know that they're working every day on this issue and trying to get some some resolution and better um, access to information and treatments that will assist uh, the patients, you, the stakeholders in this. Um, uh, let's talk about some specifics here. We want to identify patient educational gaps related to living with chronic cough. So think of it in terms of uh, patients, how you've been educated by healthcare providers, whether you're going online, just talk about where have you found um, a gap in your ability to learn about this. And we, we would really like to hear about that. We can start with, uh, who would like to start? Maybe I'm thinking, um, Let's see, how about uh, Ellen, Dr. Ellen Burns Cooper? You, you've had it the longest. <laughs> I think you've probably been through the gauntlet here, but why don't you add some thoughts there on the educational gaps? Yeah, so with cases like today where, and I have two pages of notes that I've taken uh, already, and I also talk to my physicians, I take those notes, I actually started categorizing them. I would take all my notes, type them up, and then be able to cross-reference what this doctor said versus this. It became a job. So I spent two to three hours a day after work every day. So I would walk literally I think, hundreds of hours of studying cough. I've been on every online resource. And then when I hear somebody cough in a store outside, I walk up to them. And most people will talk to you. I've only had one who had a bad episode and I couldn't. But I walk up to them and say, hey, what have you found? And I literally said, do you mind if I take notes? And I've been at state fairs, I've been at grocery stores, out and about. And I will say that, and it's like a, a partnership, and they'll go, have you tried this? Have you tried that? So educating when I see somebody coughing, I was that desperate. And nobody laughed. I mean, people were embracing it. Um, listening to my physicians, I have friends who are physicians who do similar work. I would talk to them, um, online research, buying different books. And then I would crash seminars like this. They would leave them open for physicians to talk about these. I would sign up, nobody asked for credentials. So I would just go into these seminars and just listen. And so I, you name it, I tried it. But I think the creepiest one is just walking to somebody in the grocery store, why are you coughing? Do you mind if I talk to you? And that's how I've gotten a lot of the terminology that I've gotten and a lot of things to avoid. So anytime somebody tells me to avoid this or try this, I would just write it down. If it was reasonable, I would try it. So I developed my own sources and some technical sources. Hmm. How about how about you, Paulette? Uh, well, once I um, started to uh, accept the fact that I have this chronic cough, because I did in the beginning, because for 20 years I've just uh, lived with coughing with asthma, and I've had to learn to distinguish between asthma and a chronic cough, and um, when, once I finally said to myself, um, I'm believing that I do have this, and now I had to like uh, 
get my regular pulmonologist to be on board with it. And he kind of was, and uh, was one of the best doctors I ever had in my life. I love that doctor and he's retired now, but I have another wonderful doctor, but he sent me down to another doctor that said, just do whatever they want to do to find out what's really going on with you, Paulette. Just whatever they say, if they want to do a bronchoscopy, they want to do anything, whatever they want. And I went down to this doctor and she, I just, she was just spectacular to me. And she said to me, we're gonna, you have something called a chronic cough. Yes, you have asthma. They did all sorts of tests. I have to say it was Mount Sinai. And this doctor was spectacular to me and helped me out. Sent me to another doctor uh, there who was a laryngologist because I had no voice at that point. I was mm. blown up from prednisone, everything. I was a walking mess. And um, they did all the tests. And that's where I met my uh, speech pathologist. Uh, this laryngologist worked and pud this pulmonologist, laryngologist, they work with speech pathologist. And I had to work very hard to regain my voice to get a regular register back without screaming to talk. And um, that's very important. So for me, that's part of my journey that these people helped me. I did all the research. I went online. There's another doctor out there that's uh, the person has reached out to me because I'm a sign language interpreter. They want me to go out there and give this information out to people that are deaf because there are a lot of deaf people that have chronic cough. And I've not responded back to them because this doctor has a different approach than what I feel I'm not sure about yet. So I don't want to get involved with that. Um, he thinks he can, he's been in this business for a long time. I've not responded back. I spoke once to them. So there's a lot of research that I still am doing and still like, okay, is this, will this work? But yes, I did work with the speech pathologist where uh, we did odors, perfumes, odors, different, different places where to go. I have such a hypersensitivity that once I start to eat, I have to take my first bite and stop eating to see if anything, if I'm going to get a reaction from what I just ate. Was it too hot? This time it's too hot. Next time I ate something was a little too cold. Don't know, never eat, don't ever get anything with ice. So it is a process of finding what's working for you and what doesn't work for you. But all of this we had to do with water. The speech pathologist actually came to my house because I couldn't go all the way down to Manhattan, even though I'm 60, 65 miles away. It was still got to go over the bridge, got to park the car. This pathologist came to my house and it worked out for months. We did, we worked. I mean, it wasn't a couple of weeks. It was months that we worked together to accomplish how to control a cough when I see it coming on. There were certain processes and certain breathing techniques, closing your eyes having visual, visualization. I don't know if, if that's any part of your research also that when you have done your research, when you work with people, um, speaking to the pathologist, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Um, if you do any of that, and every week it was a new feature coming out, get me this, get me that, you know, and we work that way. So um, all my doctors, I have a regular pulmonologist here in my area, is one I do see down in Mount Sinai. I do speak to the other laryngologist that I originally went to. I've been in contact with him. I visited him. I spoke to him about the research and things that I'm getting involved in. So I don't know if those are gaps, but those are those are important things that I think can educate a person that is in this position. I really, sorry, I muted myself. I, you said, Paulette, that you had to learn to distinguish between asthma and chronic cough. Did you have the proper education to be able to make that determination? No, I had to learn that. I, I, How did you learn it? Who, who gave, where did you get that information to be, to know what kind of cough each one It's just paying attention, paying attention to your body. Right now, well, did you keep a cold. journal literally? Did you have a journal where you would write down? It's like it's like if someone's allergic to a food, but they don't know what. 
you I get have, tested. But I have a medical journal. Um, I've been journaling um, everything. I mean, forever. Um, I started doing that because I worked in the educational system, and when you're in that position, you journal every day. Um, very important uh, for every. I had a good day today, or this student. You know, I was working with this deaf student, and this is what happened that day. So if anything goes back, you know what you're talking about. So I've journaled. Um, yes, so I have journals. But I started once it started happening when the first time the doctor said to me, you have a, uh, a, a it's a called, he called it sensory neuropathy and a, a nerve, some, it was neurological. And I was like, oh, and I started to do research on that. So I started saying, but I have, a, I have asthma and I'm coughing and this and that. And then I started to realize this cough here is different when I'm feeling tight in my chest. And if I'm coughing because I feel tight, okay, you're just coughing because you feel, you feel tight. You better go take your little, I take a cortisol uh, inhaler, two puffs in the morning, two puffs in the evening for my regular asthma. And that's all I'm on, except I do have a rescue inhaler. Where and I happen to use it because when I do feel this cough, where I feel like my my airways are be tightening on me, I will take that inhaler, and I, I'm not too anxious to give me two puffs. I only take one because I know that it aggravates my throat, aggravates my tongue, aggravates the roof of my mouth, and I use a spacer. So it's well, a lot. Right, sure. It's one of the things. And I wanted to ask you, uh, based on that, when we talk about educational gaps, this whole idea uh, that uh, Dr. Brayman was talking about, too, of the neuropathology of this and the, the upper respiratory and the brain receptors there and the nerve connections. Do you receive education about that? Is that something that's explored as well? That almost seems like you're going down a totally different road than what a traditional pulmonologist would deal with. I addressed to me. Um, yes. 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 So it is definitely a gap. Um, certainly, clinically, clinical presentation. A lot of times, in in patient has a cough, and there's going to be a certain number of things that are going to be looked at. I, I always say cough is one of those things that um, people don't. Um, most lay people don't automatically uh, understand as a, a symptom of asthma. But as Paulette said, it's a different type of cough. It's caused from a tightening in the chest versus this is more of a reactive, um, you know, higher cough that's just irritating and annoying. Um, so there is a gap there. Um, you know, if, if they rule out, well, you don't have these more, um, as Dr. Weiss says, these more serious diseases, then you just have a cough, you know, and kind of leave it at that. I think I've done a lot of kind of, you know, PubMed searches, searches and looking at different uh, treatments that might involve pharmacologically. Um, if it is a hypersensitivity, it's a neuropathy, it involves nerves that uh, feed from the brain to the, to the upper airways, um, you know, what can suppress that? And, and certainly there has to be education surrounding it. You know, we can do these, but these are going to come along with a certain set of side effects that you have to be willing to accept um, if you're going to do these on a long term basis. Because, you know, there is no um, other than this, this being a, a hyper reactivity or hypersensitivity of those nerves. And I don't know who described it very well as um, I, I think uh, Lori did that, you know, different things uh, make these even more sensitive. Uh, those are all just good pieces to know because you have to know, you know, this, the, the, the triggers and how to control them, you know, and I've never had any, anybody clinically say, let's send you to a speech pathologist. Let's look at other ways to um, handle this from a more holistic standpoint. Um, and, and a big educational gap is just to recognize this diagnosis. I think that's the biggest thing for both, you know, clinicians and for patients. Oh, it's a, it's a real diagnosis. It's, it's, you know, refractory cough is one thing, but um, that just kind of buckets it into, this is a cough that can't be explained by anything else. 
And, you know, maybe it has to be something that is um, more descriptive of it or, you know, goes more to the cause of this, this hyperreactivity. Um, interestingly enough, um, I think there needs to be some education and more research down the lines of is this a, um, can this be genetic or, you know, passed down because of um, some type of, um, you know, things that you inherited as far as your structure of your upper airway or your nerves, because my mother had this cough for years and years. And, you know, we would all be like, oh, don't talk to her now because she's having a coughing fit, you know, and she had no asthma. She had nothing that would be underlying this disorder. And we all just kind of accepted it. And, you know, she went into sometimes these it, it affected her socially a lot, you know, um, but it wasn't well recognized. You know, you don't be like, oh, I'm really, I feel for you or, you know, it's like uh, this, you know, people surrounding you, like you said, COVID or no COVID, they just don't want to be right next to you if you're coughing, 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 you know. So I think recognizing the diagnosis is one of the key things that I see. I want to give the doctors a chance here if you want to come in with some of this um, educational sort of stuff. In particular, this question about uh, neuropathy or speech pathology. Uh, I just from my own experience, when I didn't have my voice for that period of time and I had this cough, and he told me you have to stop coughing. The this was an ENT. You need to sip water whenever you get that urge. That urge is overwhelming. Like when you have this, it's it's and I maybe could have benefited from a speech therapist. How do you close that educational gap of saying if your provider doesn't mention to you, maybe you need to go to a speech pathologist or therapist to help you with a breathing technique or psychologically helping you get through a coughing paroxysm? You know, uh, anyway, your your thoughts, too, on that, the just the educational options of what's out there for this chronic condition. Uh, this is Sydney Brayman here. I can perhaps <laughs> address a couple of the issues that have been that have come up. <clears throat> First of all, I'm fascinated about the question mark. Gee, could this be genetic? Uh, we know that women are twice as more likely to have chronic cough than men. Why? We don't know. Uh, yes, it could be genetic, but perhaps there are other things. You know, with respect to education, I am also, as others, very excited about uh, the fact that the American Lung Association has sort of taken this uh, as a, an important uh, uh, you know, future uh, program to educate uh, the public, educate patients about, about this condition. I will tell you that um, uh, my, my uh, estimation is that uh, there are not a lot of physicians who have been adequately educated about, about chronic cough and, and uh, the cough hypersensitivity syndrome, uh, partly because it, it is a relatively new concept. As you heard from Dr. Wise, the Europeans we're a step ahead of, of us here in the States, uh, sort of uh, uh, proposing uh, this as a cause of, of why patients uh, just are not responding to the various uh, uh, medications, even when we think that we uh, ha have a, a specific diagnosis like, like asthma. So I think that that's uh, uh, something that it obviously is needed. Uh, we are now doing some national programming, trying to get uh, physicians, clinicians, uh, to uh, appreciate more uh, about the unexplained cough. And, and as I said, we're just uh, hoping uh, that uh, in the future, in the next few years, we will have adequate uh, you know, drugs that will target this, uh, this hypersensitivity of the nerves. We had a few drugs that we've used, the so-called neuromodulator drugs that, try, that, that have been used for neuropathic pain, such as diabetic neuropathy. Uh, they were somewhat successful, had a lot of side effects. So they didn't really uh, um, get widespread use. Uh, but I think we're now really uh, zoning in on more specific mechanisms. As you heard, there may even be some what we call, uh, physicians call central mechanisms. That is the brain, the, the central nervous system um, and, and its involvement. So I, we're getting there. But I, honestly, I think the educational gap is, yes, for, for patients. But I think it's also very steep uh, for clinicians in general. Um, because we really have been behind the eight ball in understanding the mechanisms of cough and how to approach uh, uh, the cough that's not responding. Right. Uh, Dr. Slovar or Dr. Wise, does one of you want to jump in with a thought? Sure. So um, 
Yeah, I would agree that there is a, I, I honestly think the more significant gap is in the providers. Um, because, you know, frankly, if you, if somebody has lost their voice and there is not a very clear organic, meaning structural, inflammatory, neurologic, there's not a clear cause of that. The first, the immediate referral should be to a voice therapist, which is a speech pathologist that's, that knows how to treat voice disorders. And frequently, the other thing that's super interesting about this disorder is about 50% of people with chronic cough have a voice disorder. And in many of these patients, probably a majority of them, it's not because of the irritation of the coughing, even though that certainly can play a role. It tends to be something else. So typically, if you, you know, most patients that I see in my practice that have a voice problem related to their cough, if it's due to inflammation, the voice has a specific sound. It sounds like classic laryngitis. It's kind of rough. If the inflammation is significant enough, they may lose their voice completely. Most of the patients that have this condition, however, their complaints about their voice are things like my voice cracks, my pitch ch suddenly changes, my voice is unpredictable. So it's fine sometimes and sometimes it's just really bad. That is not an organic voice condition. That's what we call a functional voice problem. And generally it's due to muscle tension. And, the, and whether or not the chronic cough and this muscle tension voice problem are two, two parts of the same underlying condition or all of the coughing, which is a very muscular tense um, act contributes to resting muscle tension in the vocal mechanism and the voice does not work well under muscular tension. You know, so we don't know what's the chicken and what's the egg there, but the 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 thing that um, I just observe all over, all, all the time is that these patients aren't readily referred to a voice pathologist. And there is no other profession, there's no other clinician out there that is equipped to treat a voice problem that is due to muscular tension. There's no drug you can throw at it. There's no surgery you can throw at it. It, it can only be treated behaviorally. And oftentimes just treating the underlying voice tension contributes to a, a significant improvement in the cough. So yes, I want patients to be more educated about this, but the providers need to be educated not only in this as a treatment option, which by the way is completely innocuous. There's no risk involved. It's inexpensive. It's relatively quick to know if you're gonna get a response, um, at least to, to start getting a response. So it should be offered more often. And then the other thing- So how, that, do, how do patients find out about that though? Like even now, I've, I've seen Paulette nodding her head. I've seen Ellen kind of nodding her head. If they're interested in that, where do they get that information? How, how do they find it? They don't find it easily. They find it by talking to people. The only place they find it is through medical providers. Now, we could- Which goes to Dr. Brayman's uh, point about just needing better education yeah, of uh, physicians and yeah, providers. Physicians need to be educated. Mm -hmm. Now, we Let can run commercial yeah. campaigns and everything, and that might help these patients. But ultimately, you only go see a speech pathologist because a physician or nurse practitioner or whatever has said, you should go see the speech pathologist. We have to have a prescription to even bill your insurance. Gotcha, right. Dr. Wise? Oh, I think you have to unmute, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I think Lori uh, has, uh made it clear that there are uh, speech pathologists who can specialize in this and understand it. But I also want to point out that those are rare people. Um, there are not very many speech pathologists who really understand this condition or can treat it and have the patience uh, to um, to treat it. Um, uh, so, so that's a gap uh, not only in training but also in uh, personnel, really. Uh, one of the things that I, I think is also important is to recognize um, 
how a cough develops where uh, an individual has a sense of what we call cough pressure, a tickle, a need to cough that builds up and builds up. And then finally, this eventuates in a cough. And the cough is actually a relief. It's not the uh, disease itself. It's the cough pressure. And, uh, and, and we also, uh, I think, may tend to underestimate the magnitude of the mechanical forces that occur during a cough. The airways just slap together and you can demonstrate um, that um, uh, if you, you, you take a laboratory animal and induce coughing after four or five maximal coughs, the cells lining the airway uh, become damaged and uh, it leads to more inflammation and and we think even uh, opening up these nerves that are uh, underlying the airway uh, to become um, uh, exposed to uh, the environment and and that may lead to more hypersensitivity and that's the sense that we have that coughing begets more coughing and that's the basis for um, uh, uh, cough suppression therapy, if you will. If you can suppress the cough, you can uh, very often ameliorate the, um, the progression of it and the worsening of it. <clears throat> so explaining that to patients can be very difficult because I see so many patients who have been to well-trained, well-meaning physicians uh, with a chronic cough, and they come back and they say to me, all he or she told me was stop coughing, <laughs> just stop <laughs> coughing. And uh, what I think um, they're trying to say is that uh, there are techniques uh, and, and um, methods that you should try to not give in to this cough pressure that eventuates in a cough. And of course, uh, that's partly medication. It's, it's partly behavioral with breathing techniques, distraction techniques, and the like. The way that I explain that to patients is to use the analogy of an itch. Everybody's had an itch, and it builds up and builds up and builds up, and then finally, you scratch it. And everybody knows that if you scratch it, it's going to make the itch worse because you've damaged the area and uh, and as it heals, you'll get more itching. And that's very analogous both in terms of the nerve pathways and the sensation to chronic cough where there's this pressure that builds and builds and builds and then finally the cough occurs and it can occur in a paroxysm or, or multiple uh, coughs. So um, uh, I think trying to get patients to understand that, and I think natively patients do understand it, but a lot of physicians think the problem is the cough. But I think if you target the problem as the cough pressure that precedes the cough, uh, you, you get a better understanding of it. The other thing I think that's very important is to let patients with chronic cough know that they're not crazy, okay? Because they get a, a vibe. I don't think anyone tells them they're crazy, but they get a vibe from providers who are frustrated that um, that there must be something wrong with you, you know, because I can't find anything. And mm -hmm. it's very important for the patient to understand that um, uh, that it's going to take work, that it may not be successful, but that um, uh, uh, that that it's not their fault that uh, they have a chronic uh, chronic cough. So. So those are all uh, areas around uh, education. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, patient and caregiver support gaps. Um, you've touched on some of them, each one of the patients, but um, again, Ellen, why don't I start with you? What stands out the most to you right now? If you're looking at immediate attention that you'd like to be given to this when it comes to patient support 
and caregiver support. Uh, the caregiver can be the people you live with. Um, you know, someone, uh, I even look at it as uh, an employment situation if you're with coworkers, um, that in some ways they become your, your, your best friends or at least the people you spend the most time with each day. But what are the gaps that you see there with, with uh, support? For this. Um, I think Dr. Uh, Weiss just touched on something, which was that idea that, um, well, it must be you because I've gone through the litany of possible things it could be, and it's not that. I think all of us have experienced that at one time or another with our provider, or, you know, when you have a problem with your car and it makes a noise, and when it goes there, it didn't make the noise for them. Then it becomes you. You're just hearing things. But what is the support, uh, the critical support gap that you would like to have filled when it comes to caregivers and patients? I think it goes back to the last one we talked about with education. Um, like, for instance, Dr. Lori hit it on the head. I, I told someone, I think is how I'm pronouncing words. When I say something with an H, it does this. When I say something with a C, it does this. So I avoided those words. I would go out of my way to avoid certain word patterns or make up another word for it. And I kept mentioning that. And my doctor goes, it's GERD. Well, we ruled that out after I put scopes down my throat. And then he says, you have asthma. Well, we ruled that out. It's education and having multiple levels of education. But I can see where that's difficult. If his specialty is gastro, he's not going to learn about speech therapy. If this person's specialty is MS, they're not going to take the time to learn about something else because they're already specialized. So if there is a way to get comprehensive education around things like cough, that here is a number of things that it could be. Even that would have been very helpful to say it's more than these. But I was like a nail and everybody had a hammer. I'm a nail. So when I came in, whatever their specialty was is what I had for that day. And then I got convinced of it. And when I would offer things up, it would seem as though, and I'm going to say this and my physicians don't get mad at me, but their frustration led them to thinking that I was questioning them. I'm not questioning your specialty at all. I'm simply saying we ruled out asthma. I don't have it but you continue to want to treat me for that and refer me to people who do that. So if there's a way to get a comprehensive level of knowledge, they don't have to know it, just here are some resources for you to discover. The gastro people just sent me to more gastro people. If we could have more resources and then also when the frustration happens that you're not able to solve, because I get it, they wanted to help me. And that's where the frustration came in. Please don't, and it just about every case, I felt like that was turned on me. Then it became, it went from, okay, what's your lifestyle? Are you sure you don't smoke? Pretty sure I've never picked up a cigarette. My mom died of lung cancer. So I would hate for that to come out. Because as soon as that came out, because she did smoke, it was, are you sure? How much were you around your mother? Then it became my lifestyle. And so I, it's just, I guess I'll sum up as, more comprehensive education. You don't have to be an expert at all of those. Offer more resources to the family, even if we are left to do our own research, giving us even some of the terminology. What I just learned today was just amazing because some of these words I hadn't heard before, even in my research. And then when you're frustrated, make sure that's not turned to the patient as this is your issue and you're causing it. That was what was frustrating the most. Thank you. That's that's excellent feedback. Um, how about you, um, Dr. Selig? Your thoughts on those critical support gaps that exist for people who are living with chronic cough and those who love and care for them? Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is unfortunately um, kind of what Ellen was describing is is not only it, it can be the case for not only this, um, if we want to call it a disease or, you know, a, a diagnosis, which is relatively, has very low recognition between patients and clinicians. Um, so you're going to get isolated out into individual pr practitioners that say, you know, let's investigate and see if it's GI. Let's investigate it, see, send you to an allergist, you know. Um, and you're you're rarely going to get somebody that looks at the whole picture, but unfortunately, this this happens, you know, throughout the um, healthcare industry, more often than not. I mean, I have a husband who has Parkinson's, and um, you know, it, I it's a tough road all the time. You know, I say, um, well, let's you know look at 
this aspect of it or this aspect of it. And, and you really have to be your own family advocate, your own caregiver advocate, in or, and you have to have the education there available somewhere um, to be able to say, can we try this, please, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, the most frustrating thing is to do research, present it to somebody, a clinician, only to have them say, well, that's not really, you know, we don't, <laughs> you know, and then, I mean, I've even taken, you know, studies into different uh, clinical settings and you get, you get shut down pretty quickly that way, I know. Um, and I work in evidence-based medicine, so um, I think those are educational gaps. There, so there needs to be a recognition of the disease um, all the way around, and then there needs to be openness and, uh, you know, a more um, umbrella or holistic or comprehensive understanding of the different causes and the different solutions to it. So. Because, um, and Paulette, you've had your hand up for a while now. Uh, the, the one thing I was wondering, when you live with someone who has this condition, in a way it's a caregiver support idea. There's, is there any one place you send them to, here's what I'm dealing with. Uh, how do you how do you make your family members knowledgeable about it? My mother, for instance, died essentially of COPD. She had a terrible cough, a cough that went on and on. It definitely became a factor in where are we going to go to lunch? It's going to be embarrassing because mom is coughing all the time. And it was a very loud coughing. So we never received as our family members any information like, don't blame your mother. She can't help this. It's happening. So I think that idea of that support gap that would be there for other people in your universe, as well as for you. You're on mute, so you'll have to hit that. Great. Uh, thank you. That was uh, great. Because uh, those are exactly where my track was, my mind was going. Uh, first of all, I feel extremely fortunate to even be here today. Uh, the, the doctors, the, the, the patients here sharing their stories are giving me even more and more hope. But as far as my family, once we realized what I had, because one of the questions I do want to ask as I continue with this, um, my coughing could get to the point where it would be um, so horrible looking to watch me cough because I would wrench to the point where you would vomit. Okay, so just getting that out there, it's not very fun to be in that position. So. I have a lot of anxiety when we go out places, and especially, like I said, when we start dinner, um, and you know, a cough is going to come. So, but my family is very supportive. But it actually, it almost sounds funny when we're in places where all of a sudden I would start coughing, and there would be other people around that did not know what was going to take place in that exact moment, because it can get very bad, or it can I can get control of it. So my family's very supportive. And I have my I have grandsons that are younger. They're so used to seeing their grandmother coughing like she's going to die. People got scared watching me cough. I've had instances when I've gone grocery shopping and I'm waiting at the deli and all of a sudden here it comes out of nowhere. It's very random. It's not always like, I can get control of it right away. Sometimes it's so powerful for no reason whatsoever that it will come on. It's scary. And I've coughed to the point where people surrounded me thinking that something was going to happen if they call an ambulance. Now, that's not all the time, but it is. it can happen, and it has happened. But my family is very used to me going into a very coughing fit. And people would say, and they would say, she's okay, believe me, this happens to my mother, or yes, this is what happened. She's going to be okay, trust me. And I've had family just stand there and support me that that's what's going to happen until it passes. Sometimes I've, I've had to leave the room, go to a place so that I know it's not stopping. And I will just stand there and try and make it stop. And it doesn't do it. All right, let's get it over with. And I'll do the wrenching and it's over with. I want to know if any of you have had that experience of wrenching, okay. Ellen's nodding, raising her hand. Ellen, that's happened to you as well. Oh, okay. it happened to the point where I've had a guy come behind me. Now, he might have been trying something else. I've had the Heimlich maneuver, Heimlich maneuver 
performed on me three times. And I'm like, I'm trying to get the guy off me, which causes more coughing. It's happened in a mall and he thought he was trying to help. The other guy I think was just creepy, but I've had people come up behind me to do that to the point of throwing up. The best thing about this has been now that we've gone virtual, I can just mute and go off camera before I would have to run out of an auditorium of 300 people. Mm -hmm. That's not cute. I, I um, had to run. I've had to run off the platform while I was interpreting. And yeah. if I had another, if I had a, a coworker with me interpreting, they have to come in and take over. But it is very, very it does cause anxiety. But I have to say, when going into the therapy, the, of the voice therapy was extremely helpful. It didn't cure it. It, you know, it does come on random. It's, you know, you can feel a sensation coming and you can try, but there are times when it does not, that all of a sudden it's somebody took a pin to the back of my throat yeah. and I have control after that. Well, I'll tell you what, um, Lori, Dr. Slovark wanted to say something and real quick, I'm looking at her time. It's almost 2.30. I want to give you a break because we've been talking now for about an hour and a half and uh, I'll just give you a quick refresher. Um, Dr. Slovark, do you want to quickly give a comment here? It was, here and then we'll it was just a quick comment that I think that the, the support gap is, is educating and being able to give patients information so they can educate their support people about what is going on. So that's been said. The only other comment that I was going to make that I think is one of the biggest issues with this condition and many medical conditions is the siloed nature of our medical system. And um, with all respect to Dr. Wise, I think there's probably a lot more speech therapists out there that treat this condition that there's just the lack of awareness because I get comments and emails from people that somehow find me and say, I'm in whatever state and I send out an email to a national listserv and I have never not once found a speech therapist that was within a couple hours of them. And people that have this condition are willing to drive a couple hours to go find, but it is a matter of you do have to find a speech therapist that knows how to treat this. But there's more of them out there than, than probably most medical practitioners are aware of. I, I have to say one thing, um, the speech pathologist, uh, that I work with the vocals and everything to get my actual voice, somewhat of a voice back, um, worked very closely with the doctor, um, with the two doctors that I would I work with that, that deal with me specifically with uh, this this condition. So the two doctors is a pulmonologist and the laryngologist. They worked very closely with the speech pathologist. So it was a team. I had such support. I feel like I'm the luckiest person that I have such a support group, the doctors that I have, um, and that I just I feel bad when I, I know when you go up to people, I see them and they're coughing and I feel like, hey, you know what? Hey, you know, you can get help with that cough, you know, and it could be like you're, I don't really have a cough. Yeah, it does, it does exist. This few and far between where they were multidisciplinary. All right. I wanted to also say that Kevin Love from Merck and Company is joining us as well. Kevin, thank you for uh, being part of today and listening and also for sponsoring this. Yeah, of course. Happy to be here. And like Gwyn, I'm relatively new to this space, so this has been really enlightening and really um, powerful to hear everyone's stories. All right. Well, stay tuned. We're going to take a quick break just to let you get up and uh, use the restroom or take a drink of water, whatever. And we'll, we'll come back and why don't we give ourselves like five to eight minutes, 10 minutes at the most. Sounds good. Thank you. We'll be back. Hey, Nell, I'm yes. going to uh, try sharing my screen and I'm going to try to make sure the tech part works. Yeah, right. definitely. You see it. Looks great. I do see it. Yes. You want to just switch to the next one to make sure it's switching well. The next slide. Yeah, um, it's throwing up uh, errors on my computer wanting additional security. So this is good. This is good that I tested because I need to I need to make some changes. OK, so you see the first screen. Let's see if I can. Does that work? 
Yes. Yep. I see my story public version. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Looks like uh, I am good. Okay. Sounds good. Thank we'll you. be to you in, I guess, you know, more or less a uh, half hour, 35 minutes. Okay. Perfect. Sounds good. Okay. I'm just going to mute myself for a minute here. So he gave me a bunch of notes too. And then we called it filling out. And he saw it and see how you do the crap. And he said,
link. link. And now yeah. it's All right, I just wanted to make sure too that we have, uh, let's see, we have Paulette, we, we're just waiting for, um, and Dr. Ann Seeleg, is she back with us? Get, we'll give her another minute or so. Um, Dr. Selak, just let me know when you're back on. You can hear me. I see we have Ellen and we have Paulette. Just wanted to give our other patient, Dr. Selak, a chance to uh, join us again. Okay, well, we could start talking and then we'll we'll have her join us. Uh, one of the areas that we really, and we appreciate dialogue uh, between the doctors and the patients here, it's about setting expectations. Someone else had, had gotten into this during the course of the conversation. But, you know, when we're patients and we show up at the doctor's office, we, um, we probably do have expectations and maybe we're not always the best at articulating them. But doctors have expectations as well. Healthcare providers uh, want the patients to be providing certain things, whether it's your list of medications, when your symptoms started, how they manifest themselves, et cetera. So making sure we're all on the same page is really important here with chronic cough. And so I wanted to start, to, we'll start first with the patients and hear from you. And the more specificity you can give to the expectations you have of your healthcare providers, your physicians would be helpful here in uh, creating a framework for uh, dealing with this condition when you present at a medical professional's office and how we can make that process better. So first, um, Paulette, what, what are, Paulette or Ellen? Oh, there, Anne's there as well. Okay, um, uh, uh, who can go first yet? I think, um, Anne, maybe you didn't speak first. We're talking about the specific expectations you have of your healthcare providers when you're presenting with this chronic cough situation. You know, we're trying to identify those exact specific kinds of expectations you have. And in some cases, if they're unmet expectations at this point, just articulate those so that we can make sure they get addressed. <coughs> All right. Um, I think the main expectation I have is to to understand, to have the clinician or the healthcare provider understand what's important to the patient. Um, because I'm there's a lot of um, I you know there's a lot of guidelines that exist, and obviously if this is such a um, relatively new um concept there's not going to be guidelines that surround the correct way to approach this so what's um, important to you as a patient can you tick off even three things <clears throat> that you expect of a healthcare provider when you when you come there with this condition to uh, make suggestions on what we could do to try to diagnose what's going on here to follow up when we hit dead ends and say, let's try this instead, um, not to just channel it. You know, I had uh, one healthcare provider just said, Let, why don't you go see an allergist? And then that was a negative, nothing wrong there. So we never had another conversation regarding it. And, it, you know, it, it keeps falling on me to be the, the, to speak up and be the squeaky wheel. Um, <clears throat> Just, you know, to recognize the importance of this is a cough, this is not necessarily COPD, this is not necessarily asthma, but this is still important to me. 
OK, how about you, Paulette? It's your specific expectations of healthcare providers who are addressing your issue of chronic cough. Listen to me. That is the number one thing. That example, um, going through this, uh, when I think back and I first started to, I finally accepted there is a different, there's different, there's, there's a difference between my asthma and a difference what I'm feeling because I actually actually wheezing even in my up here in the upper areas that was so constricted, but uh, and so oversensitive. And just listen to me, and just please listen. And sometimes if you don't feel like they're just not listening to you, I hate to say that, but then finally, you know what? You keep saying it over and over again because you keep going back saying some you know like what you're you're looking for help. And you're hearing one doctor telling you one thing, yet you're trying to get the other doctor to come on board with that. So finally, um, I go see a different doctor that he recommended. And he comes on board later um, because another colleague is understanding that just listen to what the patient is saying that I'm really experiencing this. What the heck is it? It doesn't stop. I mean, it's different. I'm, I'm wrenching, I'm vomiting, I'm just, you know, listening. That's my big, that's it my It sounds take. like also coordination of care. Um, there's a difference if there are, uh, there are different specialties and provider systems, but getting them to talk together, is that what you're saying? Yes, uh, they were talking to one another. I just felt uncomfortable. Can I just say that? Um, sure. I love both of these doctors. With they've helped me out in so many situations. Uh, in the hospital, I met, my life was saved. I had an asthma so bad. But at the same time, just there's something else going on. Just and then the other doctor, I would say, are you sending him information? Like you emailing? Yes, I'm emailing him. And I say, okay. So I would go to the doctor. Did you read what that doctor so and so said? Uh, yes. And I was like, so what do you think? Well, you have asthma, Paula. <laughs> okay. Yes, I do. I know I have asthma. And that's all I got. We're doing the best we can. You know what? I'm going to have, I want to send you down to somebody else. Now, you have to understand this is not just two days later, this is weeks and weeks, maybe a month. And I'm going to send you down and want somebody else's eyes to look at you. And when I had somebody else's eyes look at me, this doctor's eyes had different eyes to see what was going on. And this doctor sent me to another doctor that had another specialty and they worked together. And that's where I got the voice pathologist and where I feel I'm very fortunate at this point that every doctor I see is on board. Good. All right. Ellen, uh, your unmet expectations, where they can do better um, when it comes to treating your and talking with you about how to approach your chronic condition. Yeah, it's a lot of what Ann and Paulette talked about, but actually it got to the point where so many different states and doctors, I think it's six or seven states, mm. 13, 14 doctors or more. I actually developed a checklist and if you can't comply with my checklist, I don't waste my time to see you anymore. And it, it I, honestly, I, I I have it here. No, yeah, give us an idea of what's on that checklist. I'm gonna round it down, and maybe that's why no doctors want to work with me. But no pre visit <laughs> diagnosis, no pre visit. Before I would get in, they would tell me what I had without having talked to me. How is that possible? So no pre visit diagnosis, active listening. You know, not just looking at me nodding. I know you're thinking about something else. Active listening. Validate that you've heard me and it's real. Two validations. You heard me and it's real. Open to options. Like when I asked to go to see somebody about my vocal voice, I think it's something with the speech. And but no, Ellen, that's not it. And now when I see Dr. Lori, I just want to call that guy, but I'm not going to do it. Educate not just on their specialty, but educate me on other resources. Have a systematic method to Paulette's point. Go here, go there. I was at a different doctor every day. I was at an MS doctor and I was at an allergy doctor. I, I didn't know I was losing it. And then follow up based on that systematic method. 
And the last one you mentioned was, you know, coordinating care. I actually will go a step, collaboration with the other doctor. Don't just coordinate. And I'm a member of the team. They came back and said, we've decided you have allergies because of your time in Ohio. I said, well, I'm a member of the team and I haven't been in Ohio for one year. So I'm sorry, why didn't you consult with me? So if I rail it off, no pre-visit diagnosis, active listening, validate you heard me and it's real, open to uh, options that may seem different, way different from your specialty, educate me on resources, have a systematic method. And I'll even keep up with the data, I don't care. Follow up and collaborate instead of just coordinate my care. And that's you what I'm asking. Through that, if, if you get a new um, doctor, uh, when do you go through that checklist before you make the appointment with the doctor? I send it online through typically most of the hospitals have some kind of patient portal. So I don't call them and take their time, but I email this and say, you know, am I asking too much? If so, I completely understand. I can look at other providers, but this is at minimum what I'm looking for just because it's been 30 years of this. And what kind of response do you get to that? <laughs> does, does that signal you problem patient? I'm, I'm, we're not going to take you. We're too busy. It's or, probably uh, something in my record. Don't see her. For ones that have been really helpful, it is, oh my God, can I have that checklist? So it's been all the way from that and they've been very helpful. What's the difference between coordination and collaboration? And I walk through that. For some, they love it. Others, it is, we have a process and I get the we have a process speech. And I say, well, I have other options. I appreciate your time. Thank you. But I think I'll see someone else. So it's usually no middle ground. It's either I appreciate you saying that. Absolutely. That's how I work. Thank you for that. Or I get the speech. It's almost like you have to become a professional patient advocate for yourself, but really approach it with utmost professionalism. And, and maybe that's that's obviously what we should demand on both sides. But I want to give the, the uh, providers now, the doctors and the uh, medical uh, the providers, an opportunity to talk a little bit about their expectations of the parent, what, uh, patient. What you just heard here, obviously, or some of the, some of the direct feedback uh, from patients who are going through this. But you also are professionals. You have your own approach to medicine and how you interact with patients. Where, what do you think of these ideas? What do you, what are your expectations of the patients with chronic cough who come to see you? We want to make sure this we're developing solutions and approaches that work for both um, with obviously the relieving of these symptoms. The, if it's able to be cured, fantastic. But we want this to be productive meetings that both sides feel that they are doing their utmost to solve the problem. So let, why don't we start with uh, Dr. Um, Brayman, why don't we just start with you, your thoughts on all of this? Oh, I can't hear you. You might be muted, Dr. Brayman. Does anybody else hear him? If you hear him, raise your hand. How about now? Can you hear me now? Now I hear you. I oh, now good, hear good, you. Good, good, Excellent. Put this up a little bit. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, the, I thought the, uh, the comments from patients were just uh, right on. Terrific. And it's all about communication, communication, communication. Uh, Dr. Wise and I learned many, many years ago in medical school, I guess it was Sir William Osler who was telling us uh, about listen to your patient. He or she is uh, telling you the diagnosis. Uh, you know, uh, I, a number of years ago, there was an excellent uh, um, study that was done looking at why patients come to the doctor with their chronic cough. What, what's the major reason for that? And absolutely the number one reason, far and away, a large majority of patients, they just needed reassurance that, uh, that, that it was nothing serious. And in most instances, it isn't serious. They're not gonna have lung cancer or other serious conditions. So I think that's the first thing, you know, assessing whether that patient has that fear, whether that's really why they're there, and uh, I think that's uh, one of the things that, that needs to be right up front because they're concerned that there's something very seriously wrong. And in most times it's not, and we can help them. Uh, the second thing is I heard, I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was because I was uh, not online here. I was on my phone, but w one of you is a pharmacist. And I heard that you said that Dr. it was Seeley. really, Dr. Seeley. And I, what I heard was, uh, gee, it was my family that thought there was something wrong. 
And uh, uh, they were the ones who were pushing me, me in. Well, that's not the most uh, important reason for going to the doctor. It is really one of the, one of the top reasons. So uh, you need to reassure the patient to reassure the family that there is nothing that, that is so seriously wrong. I'm reminded of a, of a patient who I saw many years ago uh, with, uh, with my associates uh, at Brown uh, who came in to me because she was on her way to a psychiatrist to take care of her cough. Her husband was absolutely convinced. She had been to this doctor and this doctor and this doctor, and she knew that there was nothing up here in her head. She knew that there was something down here in, in her lungs that was causing the cough. As it turns out, she was one of the first patients we saw with cough variant asthma. Uh, but indeed, uh, it was really her sense that, no, the family was telling her there was something basically wrong, uh, but there really wasn't. So I think that's really what needs to be uh, 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 convey to the patient. That's really often what the patient is concerned about and what the family is concerned about. Uh, the next thing is, I, I think that letting them know that, yes, there are certain diseases that we can uh, uh, discover, uh, that we can treat with specific treatment, and that there's a high likelihood of getting you better. But here is the other message that needs to be heard by the patient over and over again, that sometimes we cannot, cannot cure that cough. And sometimes it is what we call the refractory chronic cough. And that needs to be uh, understood. Uh, I will tell you that, that some of the stories that I've heard uh, about response of physicians has more to do with the doctor than the patient. That doctor is not feeling comfortable because they can't figure it out. I've been in that situation before. I know I'm feeling I'm letting you down. Uh, I'm, I'm not a good enough doctor to figure out what the problem is. I don't have the right uh, formulation. So a lot of times those doctors are really avoiding you because they just don't want to look in the eye and say, hey, I'm failing. I can't get the answer. But on having patients understand that that is going to be frequent, that you're going to find at times this is going to happen, that the doctor can't cure your cough. So that's the time when, uh, again, if you're putting together a, a, a patient support group uh, um, a, a memo or something out there or, or a pamphlet, uh, that they need to ask, what other physicians can I see or what other therapy can I have, such as speech therapy. First. Uh, I, I think that's uh, uh, something that would definitely be in some brochure, some patient education brochure, that there is this possibility uh, that you can be helped by a speech pathologist. Uh, so I think that's the, those are some of the issues that I think that I would be uh, covering. Uh, some of the some of the responses really to what I heard uh, from from our uh, coughing uh, patients. Just curious, Just curious, if you got a checklist like that from from Ellen, would you say, "Up, oh, skip that woman. I'm not going <laughs> to. She's not going to be my patient." Or would you say? This is an intelligent professional approach to healthcare in 2021. I want a patient like that because she's uh, going to hold me accountable. Yes. And she's also yes. probably going to hold herself accountable yes. because that's we patients have that obligation yeah. as well to hold ourselves accountable of knowing when did you get these symptoms? How, what happens when you get it? I think of all the things I've, I had my children say, oh, I don't feel well. Well, describe that. I can't. I just don't feel well. No, that's not good enough. <laughs> you know, you have to know, articulate what's happening to you. And you have to be a good listener. Uh, you know, a lot of doctors, uh, you know, they they too have their checklists, and they want to get through this uh, this exam, and they know that this is this is their their checklist. Uh, I, again, you'll forgive me, but I have another wonderful story of a, of a patient who came to me. He would, had been coughing for about four or five years, and he had been seeing this doctor and that doctor and this doctor. And then I asked him, I said, "Well, when did this cough start?" He said, "You know something?" He said, "I know exactly when it started. I was sitting at the side of the pool." And I usually use earplugs because I had a problem with my ear and I put earplugs in to, uh, to prevent the water from getting in my ear. And he said, you know, I, I, I often take it out and put it in my mouth and chew a little bit because it was a little rubber earplug. I swallowed it. Well, guess oh. what? He didn't swallow it. It was in his lungs. Four years later, he was coughing. We removed the earplug and the cough went away. Listen to the patient. He had seen three or four other doctors ahead of time. So I think that that's... No, I, I I like the checklist. I like the listening. I think that's an important. Uh, uh, yes, it's important for, for us to hear. I suspect that some of the older doctors with some gray hair like me may not be as uh, as conducive to, to to having that kind of an email. But certainly the younger crew definitely would. 
Well, let me go to, first I'll go to your older colleague. Well, <laughs> contemporary, I, I don't know. What should I call you, Dr. Wise? I don't want to. Uh, a lot younger. A lot you, younger. Ne you never ask a woman her age, but maybe a doctor over a certain age, you don't ask him either. But Dr. Wise, I guess, what, what are your expectations of patients? And, and yeah. what do you want them to know about this illness and that when they walk in your door, these are your expectations of that? Well, yeah. So I think the, um, the issue that... Um, faces physicians is they it's they like to cure things they like to know things uh, and chronic refractory cough is one of those conditions that challenges physicians and um, it's you know there's a, a a saying among physicians i don't know if it's been said to patients or not that uh, chronic cough is like the low back pain of pulmonologists uh, because low back pain for orthopedists is one of those conditions that persists, 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 and there's really no straightforward cure for it. Um, and it makes physicians defensive. And I would be um, telling you a falsehood if I said that uh, I wouldn't be challenged by someone like Ellen who <laughs> presented me with a checklist and, you know, uh, uh, and... Uh, uh, I, I think it's a great thing. But the key point there is that it's developing a partnership. It's when you first see this patient, you have to set expectations and you say, look, I'm not going to cure you right off. This is not something where there's just one medicine, one answer, one thing you can do. Um, it's could probably a lot of things. Ellen has a checklist of 15 things that uh, she's learned over the years. Um, but, um, but you have to set that expectation and develop a partnership and say, look, this is what's going to have to happen. We're going to have to try a lot of things and you and I are going to be partners and we're going to go on this journey. And the end of this journey isn't necessarily that we're going to fix everything. Uh, what we can hope for is that we can make you uh, so that you're manageable, so that your life is not ruined and constrained by this cough, that you can go out to the movies and the church and you can travel on a bus uh, without the fear that you have but we may not be able to cure you so it's setting expectations setting up that partnership and it, it's very interesting that there seems to be um, a subtlety between referring someone to another specialty and dumping the patient okay um, and that has to be, those referrals are necessary because you do want to uh, evaluate people for allergy or have someone look at their vocal cords, uh, uh, an otolaryngologist and so on, um, check the sinuses. But that needs to be taken in the context of someone's going to be kind of the captain of the ship that you give the um, understanding to your patient that, look, we're going to work through this together, okay? And uh, I'm not going to try to just give you one prescription, and that's going to be it. And if that doesn't work, I'm sending you off to somebody else. Um, I, it's been said that most patients' dissatisfaction is that they feel that the doctor doesn't really understand that they're sick, that uh, there's a great worry about um, uh, seeming to be... Um, uh, faking it, uh, and in fact, there uh, is a um, um, you know a condition that's been called psychogenic cough, you know, and um, and uh, this is probably the same thing as what we're talking about today. Uh, it, it is a neurologic thing; it's a neural disease, okay, uh, but um, but it gives patients the impression that they're crazy, okay, and. That's got to be up front, okay? Uh, and the other thing to get across is that whatever happens, we're going to work on this together, okay? Uh, that um, uh, we're going to uh, have what we would call shared decision making. And I heard you, you know, the comment today that um, I didn't, I don't want to take Ultram, uh, Tramadol because it's a, could be addictive. It's a narcotic, you know. 
Well, that, that's a decision that's made with the doctor and the patient together. And if the doctor is too defensive about that, it's not going to work. It has to be considered a, um, a shared decision. So, um, so those are the points I would make. Doctors get defensive too. Doctors like to cure patients and they don't like it when they can't. Uh, and they uh, need to form a partnership with their uh, with their patients. Right. I just want to do one point of clarification, just so I'm clear on this. If a, when a patient comes in and you have those initial conversations about how you're going to approach treatment of this condition, making them aware that there's not necessarily a magic pill that you can be given, or it's it's going to take a, a process to determine where the cough is coming from and what it is. Are you saying that some doctors avoid any discussion of the neuropathy of it, the, the neuro implications of it because they're afraid that the patient will immediately think they're being regarded as crazy or is this something no. that, they, that you're saying doctors need to articulate there there are um neurological potential causes for this that we want to explore uh or yeah. i guess i just want to be clearer about that yeah no i i i don't think that's uh, necessarily the case that doctors tend not to use that terminology uh, but there are a lot of ways to telegraph to a patient that a doctor thinks their their patient is crazy. And we don't really use the term psychogenic cough uh, anymore um, uh, because we understand better that that this is uh, uh, due to neural pathways um, uh, and cough sensitivity. In, in many cases, there are other causes of cough, uh, but um, uh, but I was just using that as an example of how in the past when doctors couldn't diagnose something, they would consider it to be some sort of psychological problem. Yeah. Uh, and that's compounded in part by the fact that some of the drugs that are uh, have been shown to be effective in chronic refractory cough are also used for uh, psychiatric conditions, antidepressants, uh, uh, and the like. So, um, uh, so um, that needs to be explained to patients that this is, we're not treating you for depression here with, with these antidepressants. We're treating you because these have effects on the uh, nerves in the upper airway and um, receptors in the brain. Okay. Great, thank you. And Dr. Slovart, your thoughts about this? The expectations that patients need to have and that you need to have about them. Yeah, um, my biggest expectation, and it's going to be probably quite different than what doctors have expectations of. Well, maybe not completely different, but for me, the biggest expectation that I need my patients to comply with is to be open to the possibility that a behavioral approach is going to work. And half of that battle is, um, uh, preconceived notions about behavioral therapy. But the other half of that battle, probably the majority of that battle that I have with these patients is because they've been to numerous specialists and tried every test and every medication under the sun and hasn't worked. And then the, the fact that they're even seeing a speech therapist seems very strange. And the fact that I'm telling them, if you use these breathing strategies and suppress your cough, it's going to make it considerably better, maybe make it go away. Just they're just like, you're nuts. That's just, yes. Yeah, speaking of who they think is crazy, they think I'm crazy sometimes. So my expectation is that they be open. The way that I get that expectation usually is by having the knowledge myself. I can speak about this knowledgeably and, and usually... I will also say that most of the time when I talk to people about cough hypersensitivity, they have never heard it from a physician before. Obviously, we have expert physicians on this panel and they understand this. The vast majority of physicians, I would even venture to say possibly even ear, nose and throat doctors and pulmonologists don't necessarily know that most of the research with this particular type of cough is a neurologic condition. Cough has historically always been considered a symptom of a different underlying pathology. And if you take care of the pathology, the cough will go away, um, which is often the case. 
So most of my patients haven't heard that concept before. And when I start talking to them about what hyper, cough hypersensitivity is, they start going, that makes total sense. So that gives them buy-in. The other expectation I have of my patients is that they will comply and work hard at what I ask them to do because it is way harder than taking a pill. And if they do not do it, it's not going to work. I will also say that I am also very responsible for getting that expectation from my patient. If I don't adequately educate them as to the rationale of why I want them to do what I want them to do, and if I don't adequately educate them on the fact that if you do not do this um, faithfully, it will not work. I tell patients, you can be in a room all by yourself and coughing isn't going to bother anybody nor yourself. You have to still suppress because this is why and they need to understand that. I will also say, um, even though I know my question wasn't about expectations of providers, I would say an expectation of my providers, whether it be issues of myself or those that are um, sending patients to me, is that they will look at the research and they will seek answers when they do not have the answers. And I, it's just one of those other issues of our medical system when we have to funnel patients through every 15 minutes to just be able to stay afloat, that makes that really hard. Um, and then I also have an expectations of providers that they be open to behavioral therapies. And half of the what gets a patient to my door is not only the physician recommending it, but talking about it as if it has credibility, not talking about it as, well, why don't you just, why don't you try this? Yeah. Which is sometimes what they get. And I've seen many patients that have came to me and said, you know, the doctor suggested this a year ago, but I didn't really think it was credible. And I blame the doctor on that one, frankly. Right. Well, thank you for those insights. Um, and just be mindful of our time here and wanting to get this all in definitely before four o'clock. The, the final kind of key point we wanted to um, elucidate from the patients especially was uh, an insight on the key barriers uh, to your, your treatment options and to living with this cough. Uh, the social ones you've talked about, we wanna talk a little bit more about the economic ones and just the, um, when when Dr. Slovak just said, I expect you to work hard. Uh, some of you, I think about Ellen, when you talked about having your whole list of a th things that you do or don't do to trigger this so that you could get off any medications and just be doing this is considerable. But just um, if you could give us the key uh, barriers that you face in getting the care that you need, whether it's financial, distance to the provider, um, people with this specialization. You know, Dr. Wise said you might have a hard time finding someone like Dr. Slovar. Dr. Slovar says, no, if you do the research, you're probably going to find someone within a couple hour drive. Well, it is a couple hour drive. But just your personal experience of barriers in that regard, just more to the point of, money, uh, time off from work, uh, you know, those kinds of things. If you could just give us a few of those. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, to me, it's really one big one for me has been referral. Um, to see someone like a Dr. Lori, I would say, I, I wonder is the way I'm pronouncing certain words, I notice I cough more. Uh, you know, let's really look for GERD first. So being open to giving the referral, because then I would have to pay out of pocket. So I've literally paid thousands out of pocket. So I'll just go to a doctor and some won't even take me and I'll stay up front, I, I can pay out of pocket where people, other people may not be able to do that. And it was unfair, but I couldn't get the referral until I took their medicine for X number of months or weeks, or I tried these things first. So for me, that's been the biggest barrier is that they weren't open to other solutions. And the, I'm so sure, so I think it goes back to the other comments is doctors want to help you. That is what they've been trained to do, and I get it. And when they couldn't, they're frustrated. I'm okay with you saying, Ellen, I can't help you. But what I'm not okay with is, I'm sure it's this, and I take that medicine. Okay, now I'm sure it's this, and I take that medicine. I just say, we don't know, and I go, okay, well, where are some places I can investigate and look? So it's been able to get the referrals without having to jump through 15 hoops, and I have to go to all of their appointments just so my insurance will end up paying Otherwise, I pay out of pocket 
or I have to fly somewhere uh, to, to get treatment. So for me, it's been the unnecessary treatment to get a referral. Okay, all right. And how about you, Paulette? What has it been for you? The, the biggest uh, kinds of barriers you're running into more from uh, economic time, organization, um, coverage for the services, et cetera. Um, the point where I'm at right now, I'm doing very well. Uh, if you, uh, I was, like I say, I was extremely fortunate that my doctor did refer me to another doctor. And uh, I just want to clarify that about that doctor. He was a wonderful doctor and um, he felt terrible and he, he felt like I feel like I've done everything I could for you. I, I just, you know, I don't I don't see don't see it, but let me send you to another uh, pulmonologist. So I feel very grateful that that doctor didn't feel oh like a, he did. I don't think he felt like a failure or anything like that. Nothing. And that he was going to do his best to have somebody else look for me. So uh, that wasn't a barrier for me at that point. Um, and I was sent to a wonderful, another wonderful doctor and then to another laryngologist and to a another a, a speech pathologist. So and from then on, I went on my way. As far as medications and treatment, you know, I did have to put money out of my pocket because my I was not covered under insurance for a speech pathologist. Um, you know, very limited. I don't know that you know, that was just me. I, actually, I'll be honest with you. I'm a senior citizen, and um, so and I have still my husband's secondary insurance. So I did have to put out of my pocket for this pathologist. You know, which was very costly because we did months and months of this, and um, it was this pathologist was worth every penny I gave for my treatment and helped me through a lot of a lot. So. Um, if that was a barrier, fine, but I take all that information with me. It's still with me on how um, I, you know, did my lift drills and how I had to, you know, do all these different trainings and sensory issues. Um, but as far as um, my barrier, you saying you were on Medicare and you have secondary insurance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I do have to say I bill Medicare all the time for this therapy and it pays. So I don't know what happened, Paulette. Mm -hmm. was it? Um, I need that billing code, <laughs> right? She needs the billing been, code. Uh, it might have been a personal choice at this point, if I could remember, because um, it was either go all the ways into the city uh, on a couple of times a week and put the money out for the tolls, put the money out for everything or put the money out for him to say i live not far from you i will drive to your house so i think that's what that came down to uh, now that i'm remembering so anyway thank you for reminding me that um and what i feel is a barrier is um tree being treated uh with medication um i'm not 100 percent great with controlling everything so i know what to do and um, I will tell you, I have tried the gabapentin, I have tried the amitriptyline, um, and I know for a fact that um, I didn't want to try the tramadol, and I spoke to the pulmonologist about it. He said, you know, I really, you know, that is something that, you know, you have to think about that, you know, it's, you know, if you really want to try that, you can, and I felt a little concerned about taking tramadol, so I didn't. I meant after that is when I, that's when I gave up on everything. I gave up. And I lived like for quite a few years not taking anything and until I became so desperate. And I have to tell you, I was desperate. Um, and so everything that they told me to do, I would do where I went to. So it's being treated with medications is where I'm concerned for at this point. I am being treated with a medication right now. And actually, it's the only one that actually works for me. And I usually take Tylenol. Um, Sometimes like during the day, if uh, I feel like I'm coughing too much, it does take away. I feel like if it's a pain medication, it does help me somewhat. But technically at night, I take um, uh, hydrocodone, homotropy, and syrup. I take five milligrams and I've been on that for a very, very long time. And uh, I sleep. I don't wake up in the middle of the night coughing my brains out or feeling like I'm choking. 
So, and the doctor has been, you know, I, I thought, here's, this was a, this is a real thing, please don't laugh, um, that I feel scared taking it a lot of times that, um, is this going to be, am I going to be addicted? And I'm assured that what you take is you're not going to become an addict. And um, I only take it at night. And the only time I take it where I go to bed and I do rest. And during the day, if I have a, a, a coughing fits or whatever you want to call it, um, I try and get through it on my own therapy. And if it's too much, then I take a Tylenol. So that to me is a barrier. That's a barrier. Sure, I get it. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and Dr. Selig, uh, how about you? The the kind of economic time, um, psychological stress of having this, et cetera, those, those kinds of things, what stands out to you that you would want um, uh, some way, if there's a way to address it, to be done? <clears throat> so, I, it's interesting for me because I'm kind of on both sides of the fence, you know, as a healthcare provider, as a pharmacist, um, and working in trying to provide the information to clinicians in our in our database as far as how to treat things. But then being a patient, on the other hand, um, I find there's a lot of barriers still in the health healthcare system, and my biggest ones are. Um, uh, you know, I have good access to medical care. I live in the Boston area. Um, I can pretty much go anywhere here and all the major, you know, Mass General, Brigham, all those have satellite offices all up the North Shore. So my access is good. I would say the biggest barrier for me is just trying to put all the pieces together as a patient, you know, is... Um, I got to call Blue Cross. Are they going to cover this? Is this person in my network? You know, and at that point, I then start to weigh how much is this impacting my life versus how much work is this going to be with all the other things I'm trying to balance between my my profession, my family, you know, and and how much do I want to invest in it? And and I have often given up on my own health care because of that, because it just takes too much time, too much effort. Um, and like you said, with the trying to find a speech pathologist, I mean, I, I you know, it, it sounds like a daunting task to me. I, it sounds like it, it would be wonderful if it was suggested as a um, alternative from a, a health care practitioner. You know, you, we, we, we can't really treat this medically. There's not a good sustainable pharmacological approach to this. Uh, and I get that from um, what you you gentlemen are saying uh, for um, sometimes there's not always an easy answer. But you know you could you could also try this, this or this and have maybe um, within your pra practices have the resources compiled together to say, here you go. Here's a couple of suggestions, you know, and that at least gives you a, a breadcrumb of something to to try. Um, and, and it makes the patient's life easier because you got to figure the patients are, uh, you know, have this medical condition. Um, but we're just, you know, trying to seek help. help. So um, I, I would say the time and, and, and like we said, we didn't talk a lot about financial pieces. I do find... There's a lot of barriers. The you know, insurance companies are tough all the way around. They're tough for the patients. They're tough for the practitioners. Um, so that is a big barrier is to coordinate that ideal um, health care and then bring the third parties into it and try to get them on board with likewise, you know, supporting the patient and the supporting the practitioners, you know. Mm -hmm. Were you finding that your health care, you have private health insurance? Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so you, that treat, treatments were by and large covered or there were a lot of out-of-pocket expenses with it? Well, for example, when I was referred to an allergist, that that sounded fine. We're going to do some um, lung function tests. We're going to do maybe some allergy testing. And then, uh, you know, a month and a half later, I have a bill for $400 because 
you know, allergy testing is not really covered for this particular, you know, diagnosis or, you know, wh whatever, whatever the conditions were. And I don't even remember it, but, you know, those are, those are very frustrating pieces. Like I'm not going down that path again, you know? <laughs> So, so it would be helpful to know that up front before you you go through that, right? right? To get the testing. First, you would want to know, is it going to be covered? If it's not, this is how much it's going to be. Is that worth it to me? And mm -hmm. having that conversation with your healthcare provider, what are you going to find out that's going to advance where I'm going to be medically? Right, right. So uh, it takes a lot of research, right? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, I think we're going to uh, have to end that conversation here. We're looking at our time and it's almost 3.30 and we have um, an exciting session right now that's going to be led by Laura Packard and it's a storytelling session. She's a stage four cancer survivor, Hodgkin's lymphoma, an award-winning progressive digital new media and communication strategist based in Denver, Colorado. Laura has told her personal health care story for advocacy through television, radio, print and podcast interviews, through op-eds and letters to the editor, public forums and conferences, and media appearances on three national bus tours. Laura founded a C3 nonprofit called Healthcare Voices to organize adults with serious medical conditions to tell our stories. She's also the executive director of Healthcare Voter and Get America Covered, a nonprofit focused on awareness and outreach outreach for the Affordable Care Act, health insurance exchanges through healthcare.gov. Welcome, Laura. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, thank you uh, for having me here. I'm honored to hear all your stories, and hopefully some of my tips today will help you. So, I started off as a healthy small business owner in Las Vegas, Nevada. Then four years ago, I walked into a doctor's office with a nagging cough and walked out with a stage four cancer diagnosis. Uh, and that was just the start of my healthcare battle because while I was going through chemotherapy and radiation treatment, I also was fighting to keep my health insurance, which was paying for it. Uh, and if I had lost my insurance today, I would be bankrupt or dead. Uh, so it, it helped me become a healthcare advocate. And now I tell my story, uh, publicly in a lot of different ways, and I use different parts of my story for different purposes. Uh, if I'm talking about health insurance, or if I'm talking about surprise medical bills or cancer awareness, uh, so your story can be used in multiple different ways, according to, uh, what's useful for you. Uh, I've testified to a couple state legislators and I've uh, submitted testimony to Congress, uh, shared my story with a former president and the current president, and I founded my nonprofit to help storytellers like you. So your story matters and it has power, uh, but it's always up to you if, how, and when you share your story. Uh, and like I said, you can use different versions of your story for different audiences and different goals. So sharing your story today with other people uh, working through chronic cough, uh, you might go into some details that if you were speaking publicly, you would truncate some of the medical stuff and get more to uh, what your call to action is, what you want people to do. Uh, because your stories can change everything. You can change minds, uh, you can change the world uh, from passing legislation to starting new movements, uh, to just letting people know that chronic cough is a problem, that there may be people in their lives that are too ashamed to talk about it, but that uh, this is a real issue. So uh, there's several different ways you can share your story um, with your medical professionals, uh, trying to get a diagnosis or treatment uh, with your friends and family or with the public on social media, uh, with legislators, maybe one-on-one -on -one meetings or group meetings, or maybe testifying to your state legislature or uh, to Congress. Uh, you can write letters to the editor or op-eds to tell your story and uh, speaking at public events. So one of the first things to think about when telling your story is why. Why are you doing this and what do you want to get out of it? And if you're speaking for a group like a 
like today, what are their expectations of you? When I was telling my story, one of the things I try to do is capture your attention because right now I'm competing against your pets, your electronic devices, other people, uh, your daydreams. So uh, you don't owe me your attention. I have to get your attention, then I have to keep it. One of the other things I try to do with my story is make it relatable because most people do not go through cancer, but most people have had a cough at some point in their life. So if you were speaking to a public lay audience that is not chronic cough related, I would probably start by making your story relatable. Uh, you could start with something like, have you ever had a cough that never went away? I've had a cough for 30 years. So then right, right away, you're starting with relatable, something they can understand, and then you're capturing their attention with something really unexpected. And draw people in with your storytelling. So again, if you're speaking to a public audience that is not a medical audience, that's not a professional audience relating to chronic cough, uh, you might wanna leave out some of the more medical terminology and get more to the story. You know, I've seen 20 doctors over 10 years and nobody has been able to help me. Something like that. Also, I try to be brief and concise because again, uh, I often am working in a limited uh, time period, especially today since we're time crunched. But in general, if you're speaking in public, if you're speaking to a legislator, uh, you are going to have a time limit. So as you don't wanna to digress too much on your journey and make sure that you know the points you wanna hit ahead of time and hit all those points. And finally, you're going to want a call to action most of the time. You've told people your story, you've made them feel something, and now what is it you want them to do? Even if it's just you want them to have awareness about chronic cough as an issue and have more compassion when they when somebody in the movie theater can't stop coughing to, you know, they may be annoyed, but understand that there may be a medical issue that, that this person it cannot help it. So again, when you're when you're publicly speaking, when you're publicly sharing your story, I like to have a point to it, a call to action, what you want people to do with that information you've given them. So to recap some of the elements of telling your story, start with commonality so that people feel uh, engaged and can empathize with your story, that it's relatable to them and where they're at. Capture their attention because nobody owes you their attention. And so unfortunately you have to earn it. Uh, and tell a story, tell your story. Uh, because humans relate to storytelling, humans relate to stories. And stay on topic, make sure that you hit the points you want to hit and you don't get too lost in some of the details or some of the sidetracks as you tell your story. And the more you do it, the better you'll be at making sure you hit your points. And finally, finish up with something you want them to do. Even if all you're asking them to do is to change their own mind about chronic cough. And since we're running short on time, we may try it out later, but let's see how we go for the rest of this session. So, Speaking with medical professionals, uh, you also should uh, have in mind uh, before you walk in the door, why are you there and what do you want to get out of this appointment? And start with the problem. I know that I sometimes when I've visited a doctor, I don't, I, I talk about all the things that I'm dealing with instead of the key point. And if the key issue you're dealing with is that you, you cannot stop coughing, lead with that. And it helps to keep good records because in our fragmented medical system, as everybody said, you can be dealing with multiple medical professionals. They may or may not have 
your records all electronically uh, have it in front of them. Uh, my friend with lupus actually keeps her medical records on a USB keychain drive. So whenever she goes into a doctor's appointment, she can bring something up if they don't have it. Uh, I kept a whole binder full of medical records so that if I was seeing a cardiologist or pulmonologist or whatever, I had everything I needed to bring them up to speed because you are the expert on your own body. Uh, and in some ways you are more expert than they are. So it is helpful, <laughs> unfortunately in the world we live in for you to be your own medical records archivist. And have a call to action here too, in that what do you want from these doctors? Uh, maybe it's a referral to a speech pathologist, or maybe it's more testing. Maybe you would like a prescription to have uh, allergy tested and so on. But if you know what you want going into the appointment, you're more likely to get it, or at least you can talk through what you want and they can explain why that is or is not a good idea. And you may want to do a leave behind. If you're seeing somebody that is not an expert in this field, if you have information about speech pathologists or this new medical diagnosis, if you have a one pager you can leave with them so that they can do the research afterwards, uh, you can also do this via an email follow up. But I'm assuming most of the time you are not working with people that are experts in your particular condition. So you may unfortunately have to do some of the medical education to help bring them along. So to recap, you should lead with the top issue that you want them to help with and keep good records, bring them with you if you have to bring a binder, bring a box if you need to. Uh, ask for what you want and uh, leave them behind whatever information they need to uh, get more expert themselves. Um, and also send it via email because some people are better at email, some people are better at paper. So some of the other ways you can share your story uh, is via social media where you can reach a large or a select audience, uh, depending on uh, what you're trying to do. And this all goes back to the why. Why are you sharing on social media and what is it that you want to have happen? If you're looking for support, if you're looking to do more awareness about chronic cough, uh, maybe you're just talking to your friends and family on Facebook. Uh, if you're trying to reach a legislator or uh, reach uh, a media outlet, maybe you're using um, Twitter uh, and using their handles and calling out how they should cover this issue more. Uh, so there are all different kinds of social media platforms that you can use to get a larger audience uh, for what you're going through for free. So in social media, uh, maybe you're better at writing or maybe you're better at video. Uh, there's all kinds of different methods that, that you can use to tell your story. So use the method that works for you. But when you start opening up and sharing your story, you sh should look at the privacy settings on whatever social media platform you're using carefully. Because if you are going wider than just your friends and family, you may get some responses that you don't want to see because there are people in this world that do not understand. And there are people in this world, unfortunately, that are mean. And it doesn't reflect you at all. It can be somebody else having a bad day and they take it out on you. Uh, so you, you can reach more and more people. The more public you, you are, um, the, the less locked down your privacy settings are. But it can mean that you get some, a little bit of negative feedback along with it. Uh, my story has gone uh, viral several times. Uh, I've been in international newspapers and so on, and you get some pretty negative stuff the larger your story goes. But again, it, it's not about you. It's about whatever they personally are dealing with. And But you don't owe anybody your story. So if you don't feel ready and comfortable with either ignoring the trolls uh, or 
just the idea that there will be trolls, you choose. You choose what you want to share, when you share it, and how you share it. Uh, the American Lung Association, I'm sure, would be would love to work with you to share your story to a wider audience. Uh, but again, you're in control and you choose whether they just use your first name, whether they tag you in social media, whether they use your photo or whether you want to be more private. That is your choice and it's up to you and there is no wrong answer. Another way you can share your story is uh, to a larger audience via the written word. Uh, either if you're trying to do more awareness about chronic cough or whether you want people to take some kind of action. So there's a difference between a letter to the editor and an opinion piece. A letter to the editor is usually short. It's maybe 150 words or less. An opinion piece, an op-ed is longer it's uh, more like 500 to 600 words or less. But always when you're writing your story, keep in mind your why. Why are you sharing this and what is it that you want people to do when they read it? If you're trying to get your letter to the editor or your opinion piece printed, uh, it helps to use a newsworthy topic, uh, to use a news hook to get published in mass media. So, for example, if you wanted to share your story of trying to get a diagnosis for your chronic cough, it would be harder to get that published unless it was a publication that was dealing specifically with healthcare related issues with a personal story component. Uh, you might find that a, a Huffington Post that has a personal issue or um, Fox or some, uh, there, are, there are some outlets that will take personal stories. Uh, but if you can figure out a way to connect what you've gone through with larger issues in the world, especially issues that are being talked about right now on the news, it's more likely to get printed. So for example, you could talk about your struggle to get diagnosed and what it's like living with chronic cough and compare that to what it's like living through a pandemic with uh, what people are going through right now with the uncertainty and staying at home because um, there are pressures being in the outside world. So something like that to make it more topical. Or if, if you wanted to write about your story right now, you could also connect it to what uh, Congress is working on right now. Um, there's several pieces of healthcare legislation that they're working on. So if you could tie an, uh, an, a part of that legislation to your story, it would be more likely to get printed. Or you could react to something that's already in the paper. If somebody writes something that is great, or if somebody writes something that is terrible, you can write a letter or a longer piece in response to that and uh, submit it. And in terms of where to send your story, you're probably going to have more luck submitting to your local paper than to a national paper like New York Times or Washington Post or something like that because they have so you have so much more competition because they're getting so many thousands of unsolicited uh, submissions every single day. Whereas your paper, your local paper, is much more likely to uh, run uh, whatever you have to say. But again, uh, go back and think about what is your why? why? What is it that you want people to take from your story? And what is it you want them to do? So to sum up, your story matters and it has power. It's always up to you if, how, and when you share it. Uh, and once you do share your story, people are going to go to you as an expert. You'll find that you have become uh, the <laughs> unexpected support system for everybody in your life uh, that has a chronic cough or know somebody that has a chronic cough. You will find friends and random acquaintances will refer people to you and it's up to you whether you want to take that on whether you want to be the unofficial chronic cough guide to the world uh, but mostly you'll get positive support i think 
Uh, sometimes there will be some some negative, uh, especially if you've gone extremely public. So be prepared for that. But if you are not on uh, the national news, or if, if your story is in the local paper, if you're sharing on social media to your friends and family, you're going to get positive responses. Uh, some people won't understand what you're going through because they ha they haven't had uh, as much of a brush with our medical system as, as we all have. But people's heart will be in the right place. And stories change everything. They can change minds and they can change the world. So your story can make change in the world if you are willing to share it. And today is just a sampler. Uh, I talked a little bit about social media and letters to the editor and so on. Uh, I have much longer trainings available for free at my nonprofit website, healthcarevoices.org slash learn. So again, I could have done an hour just on op-eds. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little sampling of the various ways you could share your story and uh, how that works. And uh, if we have a few minutes, we can practice sharing each other's stories, but you tell me how we're doing on time. I think uh, we have about, uh, ten, let's say 10 minutes, um, but I think that the key thing that you said there was um, your it, practice makes perfect. The more you practice something like this, it's a it's a skill that can be developed. Some people are natural public speakers and some people just need a little bit of help refining their message and getting getting it across quickly as Laura can do. But uh, Laura, I don't know if there's um, I don't know if Ellen wants to step up and volunteer or or somebody else, but being able to in a microcosm, what I'd say you say your 30 second speech would give you a minute but basically to encapsulize uh, your story in a compelling way. I loved your, uh, uh, as someone who works in public relations and does this, keeping a notebook in which you write down what you felt, what happened, a uh, key anecdote. Um, if you, I was just at the immersive experience for the Van Gogh uh, exhibit in Philadelphia, and they had some of his quotes. Just taking a picture of that and taking that quote and putting it down, those are the kinds of things that you can bring back to your speech to enliven it. And I think the other thing are those very descriptive words. You know, it's not just cold out, it's bone chillingly cold, it's teeth rattling cold. You know, the way you bring a story alive with your words can be very, very effective. I think that's the point Laura was trying to make too, but I don't know if you wanna take a stab at it, but I'm sure that with her detailed trainings, that's what you get into, being recorded, telling your story. So it's kind of putting you on the spot right now to to say let's tell your story but um it might be a fun exercise and we have about now i ate up two minutes so you know you have about 10 minutes so ellen or ann or paulette would you like to try telling your story as you would to a non-chronic cough audience <laughs> <laughs> volunteer anybody I actually would say no for me because I prior to this I had no plans whatsoever to share my story. So it'll take some time to sink in. I'm here because my three sisters have chronic cough and they wanted me on the call uh, for this. So I don't know that I would share my story. <laughs> okay, and it is always up to you whether and how you share your story. I guess one of the key things that the American Lung Association is very good at doing is talking with policymakers and legislators because so often things have to be done at an executive level to get change in this country and they are staff members maybe they have experience with the illness or condition but it's those real patient stories that go to the heart i always say aristotle right laura it's the the uh, ethos the pathos and the lo logos so it's emotion that really seals the deal when you're trying to make change. You have the logical arguments, you have your own expertise that you bring to the story, but it's that emotional connection you make with someone. And I think that's why um, Annette and the folks at American Lung Association wanted to engage Laura just to plant that seed in your mind. They can't do their work in public advocacy and public awareness without you, the patients, sharing your story. And it is a personal journey and it is difficult to put yourself out there, but the rewards 
for you and thousands, millions of other patients across the United States and around the world can be profound. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sure the American Lung Association would love it if and when you're willing uh, for you to go on legislative action days and share your story with your legislators uh, to do public events, especially as this new diagnosis is rolled out. Uh, hopefully a lot more people are going to be talking about chronic cough and this is your opportunity to share uh, what your journey has been like and why we need to do something about it. I think, Anne, were you going to say something? I was going to say um, thank you to Laura because, I mean, your story is simply um, just, you, you know, A, you're a storyteller, but what you've been through is is pretty amazing journey. Um, it makes, in some ways, and that's probably what we're dealing with here, and this is why this tool that you're presenting is valuable. It makes chronic cough, you know, pale in comparison. But... Um, I think one of the key things too is to be able to present your storytelling to some of the healthcare practitioners too, to lead with what the problem is, to be, you know, because I, I sometimes I've been accused of this in by um, particularly family members. My poor family members are being thrown under the bus right and left here, <laughs> but you know, I'll go to a health care practitioner and I'm and I'm very demanding you know this is what I want this is what I think and you know if you can do this appeal in a way that says here's the impact it has on my life how can you help me and how can we work together to do this and and get right to the point of, of what you're asking and 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 you know your story of how it's impacted you and if that alone is what we can do then that's valuable you know so I have a question. What would be a good start to say uh, before an audience of people that you're speaking to start, which like a, a good introductory sentence? Well, uh, you would probably start with, I'm Paulette and I live in Middletown. I'm, I'm an ASL interpreter. And then, uh, you know, start start with the general uh, because most people have had a cough at some point. Most people have had to deal with a cough and then talk about how long you've been going through this with no relief, how many doctors you've seen uh, and what this has done to your life. Make people feel the emotional impact of what you've gone through. Uh, so I think it humanizes the issue. People might think a cough is trivial, but it affects everything. So uh, I, I think that it's important to bring that home and let people know how much of an impact it's had on every part of your life. Can I just have a thought? One thought I had too was, for instance, Ellen's story um, was, I think that someone would, was performing the Heimlich maneuver on her. You know, the other approach you can take sometimes, depending on the setting, is uh, set the scene. Imagine that you're in a restaurant and you suddenly become so overcome with a coughing spell that you bend over and you start to vomit and someone comes up and starts doing the Heimlich maneuver on you. And you're trying to stop them to tell them, no, I have a chronic refractive cough. I, it's not I'm not choking on something. You can take a more dramatic approach, but it kind of depends on the audience and the setting. But you you want to, the goal is to get your message across as best you can to the audience in front of you. So you always have to consider the audience first. Uh, who are they? What what would resonate best with them? You know, the, 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 I'm thinking if you're talking to a group of younger people, they might really, you know, appreciate that. Like, oh my gosh, can you imagine that? Um, but it's also the seriousness that medical professionals need to know. You, you had someone performing the Heimlich maneuver on you and you had a chronic refractive cough, uh, a refractive choric cough. Anyway, I interrupted. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Laura. But it just struck me that, you know, those kind of anecdotes are really gut punchers. Mm -hmm. It really makes it come alive. Like, wow. You know, I would say you so you're, think you're right. Because the few times I've gotten my doctor's attention, the ones that, I mean, many of them have been great, but the ones who kind of ignored me and sent me to the psychiatrist, you're imagining this cough, you want the attention from the cough. Who wants that kind of attention? <laughs> and the ones that I've said, I missed three funerals, four weddings, a free vacation overseas, and <laughs> Six opportunities that make money at my business. Why would I miss those? And I feel just fine. 
And that's when I finally had his attention and he listened. But you have to, it's a lot of work and energy. You have to think of something to get his attention in that moment. So you're right. When you do share those, people listen. Mm -hmm. The other piece I was going to add, and uh, again, to to compliment Laura, I mean, you tell these stories with... um, with emotion and with, you know, conciseness, but you also tell them with um, a good attitude and optimism. And, you know, you're not going into an audience or a practitioner with a bitter attitude. You know, you're going into be an advocate and tell your story, but with hope, you know, and and I think that's really important. And, and you did an just awesome job. And I'm sure you do as you present your story and your journey, you know, nationally. Well, I think also uh, your attitude and the the sort of energy you put out there depends on the audience and what you're trying to do. Uh, there's there's no point in this room with this group of people for me to be angry. There's nothing to be angry about. But if I were talking about having my insurance taken away, you know, I could go into that with a much more Mm -hmm. angry uh, public speech. And so it really depends on what you're trying to do and who your audience is. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions or quick observations? Just go to the website for a lot more trainings than I could possibly encompass in just a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was fantastic. Uh, I want to thank our uh, patients who came today, uh, Paulette Nihe, Dr. Ann Seleg, and Dr. Ellen Burns Cooper for sharing your personal stories of chronic cough and this journey you've been through. Your willingness to recount your medical journey uh, will help advance treatment of this condition and resources for thousands of other patients. And we wanna thank our panel of doctors for taking the time today. Dr. Lori Slovarp, Dr. Robert Wise, Dr. Sydney Brayman, and Dr. Al Rizzo for listening and sharing your expertise and uh, how to address this perplexing medical condition. And we wanna thank Laura uh, Packard for her storytelling suggestions as well. Thanks, Laura. The American Lung Association will feature patients' chronic cough journeys on the ALA website, and all patient profiles will be reviewed and approved by patients before they are publicly shared. The ALA's primary focus is helping you, the patients, become better advocates for your health and those living and caring for folks who have chronic cough. We'll reach out in the future if you would like to share your voice in public awareness building efforts. And if you are interested, please indicate that on the follow-up survey you're gonna get from this meeting. We'll have a final summary report of this stakeholder session for all of you in October. We wanna thank again our meeting sponsor, Merck and Company, for providing this opportunity to better understand and address the patient experience with chronic cough. We wish each one of you well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to Ellen, did a great job. And thank you to Annette and the American Lung Association for bringing this together. Thank you, all of you. you. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Be well.